honorable members the prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our Queen and to her government, to members of the Legislative Assembly and to all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the province wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideas, but laying aside all private interests and prejudice, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all. Honorable members, please remain standing as we will be led in the singing of God Save the Queen by Ms. Brooklyn Elhar. Honorable members, please be seated. Introduction of visitors, introduction of guests, ministerial statements, member statements. The Honorable Member for Edmonton City Centre. It's a miracle, Mr. Speaker. Members of the UCP caucus have found a voice to speak out against their government. Members of the government side sat quiet as the Premier fired the election commissioner, covering up investigation to fraud within the leadership race that he won. They kept mum as the health minister went to war with doctors, yelled at one in his driveway, and drove others out of their communities. They sat mute as thousands of Albertans spoke out against the energy minister's plans to rip up our Rocky Mountains for coal exploration and mining. And they brushed off constituents who raised concerns about the Minister of Environment and Parks' plan to sell off Alberta parks. They dismissed thousands of teachers and others they represent as the finance minister seized control of their pensions and have nothing to say on behalf of the 90% of Alberta teachers who oppose the Premier's new curriculum or the parents who stand beside them or the Indigenous community speaking out against their lack of accurate representation and inclusion. But now they've suddenly found their voice. They're taking a stand against this Premier. They're speaking out on behalf of their constituents. And on what? undermining the work of our public health officials and the public health measures in place to save Albertans' lives. They're stepping up to amplify toxic rhetoric and outright misinformation about the greatest public health crisis we've ever faced. This will resonate in their constituencies and with people already skeptical of COVID-19. It will embolden anti-maskers who go out of their way to defy public health restrictions and endanger others. And as a result, more people will get sick and more will die. Now, I believe elected leaders should represent their constituents. It's an essential part of our work. But with great power comes great responsibility. Our words have weight. We can change minds. So I'm begging these 18 members of the UCP caucus, consider using your voice to support science and the public health orders that will keep people safe rather than tearing them down, and to call for real investment to support individuals and businesses in their communities through this final wave of COVID-19, a far better investment than the no-jobs corporate handout they also stayed silent on. That would show they're listening and truly care about the people and province they serve. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alberta is still reeling from the most significant health and economic crisis in the province's history. The commodity slump, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the OPEC oil price wars have tested us like never before. But there is reason to be cautiously optimistic. BMO recently forecasted a 6% growth in Alberta's GDP this year, the highest in Canada. Desjardins recently indicated that the province will lead the country in economic growth, both in 2021 and 2022. Alberta tech firms have attracted a record $455 million in venture capital in 2020. And our government has recently announced another round of funding for small businesses adversely affected by the pandemic. And there's more hope on the horizon, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Jack Mintz, Director of, Chair of Alberta's Economic Recovery Council and a member of the panel, put it best when he said recently in a Calgary Herald article, quote, we've gone through such a harsh year, but we'll see a big rebound in 2021, end quote. Our corporate tax rates are on the way to being the lowest in North America because of our government's leadership, and slowly but surely, our approach is bearing fruit. Oil prices, investment, and the housing market are rebounding to pre-pandemic -pan -pre and even in some cases, pre-NDP government levels. High tech, the cattle market, and other agricultural commodities 
are also increasing in value, which are important industries in my riding of Livingston McLeod. Oil and gas, long a cornerstone industry for Alberta, is also pivoting in a big way through hydrogen production, carbon capture and storage, high tech, and mineral extraction. We are supporting these new markets and the technologies that drive them through our tier fund, which is on track to reduce emissions by 38 million tonnes by 2030 and generate nearly $2 billion in economic activity for the province. As we know, Alberta has a great story to tell. And there's reason to believe the light at the end of the tunnel is in sight when it comes to the province's economic recovery. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche. We are blessed to live in a province filled with kind and generous individuals who go an extra mile to help out our communities. Each year, 1.6 million Albertans provide over 260 million volunteer hours to acts of social good. Over the past year, civil society organizations have continued supporting Albertans and have made tremendous efforts to see the burden of pressing social issues eased during this pandemic. But there is no sector that has been immune to the effects of a global pandemic. When nonprofits struggle, so do their clients and their employees. Alberta has over 26,000 nonprofit organizations employing more than 280,000 Albertans. The number one priority of Alberta's government is protecting lives and livelihoods, and that includes the clients and employees of our civil society organizations. In December 2020, Alberta's government launched the Civil Society Fund, committing $20 million over the next three years to help address social challenges facing Albertans. $7 million of this fund was allocated for the 2020-21 year to support civil society's recovery from the impact of COVID-19. Since the launch of the Civil Society Fund, Alberta's government has received a tremendous response from nonprofit and volunteer organizations, registered charities, and informal groups all across the province. After a cross-ministry review of applications, 21 community organizations throughout Alberta will receive funding from this program, including the Boys and Girls Club of Alberta, Not In My City, just to name a couple. Nonprofits play such a critical role in the well-being of Albertans and make such significant contributions to our province and our economy. An effective recovery for these organizations will help support the recovery of our province. Reducing social issues in Alberta by expanding the capacity of civil society was a campaign commitment of this government and is another promise made, promise kept. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Hende. First cuts to education, now the draft curriculum. Parents and teachers in Alberta are not happy with the direction of this UCP government. Albertans continue to express their disappointment with the draft curriculum, and all they are met with is ignorance of their claims. The UCP claim to have widespread support for their draft curriculum, but all I've heard is the widespread concerns of Albertan parents, teachers, and others who care greatly about the future of this province. Primary education provides the foundation for the rest of our students' schooling, and it has a great influence on the lives of these students. Children are the future of this province, Mr. Speaker, and with this curriculum, instead of moving towards that bright future, we are moving into the past. One teacher created a graphic that compares the most common words in each grouping of text, showing which topics are considered to be the most valuable according to the creators of the curriculum. In the current curriculum, the words that stand out are community, Canada, and understanding. The new draft curriculum replaces those words with words like Genghis Khan and the Roman Empire. Are these really the topics that young Albertans should be focusing on in this day and age, Mr. Speaker? These topics are outdated in a time when we should be focusing on the great diversity of our province and the true history of our country. This history, however unfortunate, is important for children to learn about in order to grow into compassionate, innovative Albertans who will greatly improve the future of this province. In order to provide young Albertans with the education they need to create that brighter future, the curriculum draft needs to be revised significantly away from ideas of the past. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Leduc Beaumont has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Minister of Education released the new K-6 draft curriculum that will be piloted next school year with full implementation in 2022. We committed to depoliticizing the curriculum so that students would be best prepared to learn the fundamentals. By doing this, we removed any political bias to offer an objective interpretation of history and civics and our home. 
By moving away from the failure of discovery math and experimental teaching methods, we will allow students to finally learn proven methods. This focus on foundational competencies will improve skills and provide students with an effective learning experience. After years of declining student scores, first to 17th out of 45 in literacy in a 10-year span, fourth to 16th in math over a 12-year span, these numbers need to improve. Key learning themes will focus on literacy, numeracy, citizenship, and practical skills. By tackling these issues, the curriculum looks to teach proven best practices that will improve student outcomes. This will help students master comprehensive skills, fluently understand numbers and equations, and develop their critical thinking by drawing from history, geography, and other civics. Finally, the curriculum will also include practical skills. This will include the importance of personal budgeting, digital literacy and coding, business planning, healthy relationships, and the importance of consent. These skills are essential in future life for whatever path these students choose. This is one of the many reasons why the curriculum has been endorsed by the likes of George Giorgio and an educational psychology professor, Sheldon Kennedy and former Grand Chief Little Child. The new curriculum is balanced and will ensure that students in Alberta are well prepared for the future. The Honourable Member for St. Albert is next. They're black, brown, indigenous, white, Asian. They're gay, straight, queer, two-spirit, trans, female, male. They're the very vulnerable young, the often marginalized, very old. They're poor, they're wealthy, they're Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, etc. They're students, doctors, lawyers, scientists, environmental activists, artists, designers, business owners, teachers, service sector workers, coders. Some can't work, some are training for work, some are looking for work. Some speak multiple languages, some only speak one. Some don't communicate verbally. Some use wheelchairs, some are deaf, some are blind, some have Down syndrome, some have seizures, and some do not. I draw your attention to the one thing that intersects all of these social categorizations, and that is autism. There's a saying, once you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Yes. April is Autism Awareness Month. Autism advocates have been trying to change the name to Autism Acceptance Month, but we aren't quite there yet. We know that one in 66 Canadian children are autistic, and those are the kids lucky enough to access diagnostic services. While I appreciate the government's statement on World Autism Day, we need real investment and measurable progress, not photo ops. Investment means restoring Puff to where it was and addressing the thousands of autistic Albertans on wait lists for disability supports. Investment also means properly funding education so no child is left behind. We all have to know by now that early diagnosis, intervention, and investment results in spectacular things. This April, when you acknowledge Autism Awareness or Acceptance Month, instead of lighting something up blue and feeling pretty good about it, make a point of listening to an actually autistic Albertan. They have a lot to say about what they need and what they'd like to see. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo. Mr. Speaker, when my constituents ask me why we can't open up fully, why they can't work out in a gym or visit their families or work at their place of employment, when teachers and firefighters and so many others are asking why they can't access the vaccine, it's because we barely have any. With a population of over 37 million, just over 729,000 people have been fully vaccinated. This is less than 2% of Canadians that have received adequate vaccinations. The numbers speak for themselves. As of today, Canada was ranked 41st in the world for the percentage of their population being vaccinated. Chile, Bahrain, Pol Poland, Romania, and Czechia are examples of countries having greater vaccine success. Canada was so bad at accessing vaccines that ours is the only Western nation to draw vaccines from a supply meant for third world nations. Canada took vaccines that were meant for countries like Rwanda, Afghanistan, and Sudan. As an added bonus, we're one of only a few nations that are actually going against manufacturer recommendations by delaying second doses, simply so that the Prime Minister can brag about the number of people getting vaccine access. How do we get so far behind? The answer is quite simple. An incompetent Liberal government. Prime Minister Trudeau boasts about Canada getting 640,000 additional vaccines, the amount our American neighbours go through in a single morning. Despite pharmaceutical companies in Alberta and Quebec needing financial injections to kickstart vaccine production, scientists that have experience in creating vaccines for Ebola and Zika, they could not get funding from the Trudeau Liberals. How can the Prime Minister justify his reckless COVID-19 spending, but then turn around and fail to fund Canadian vaccine creators during a crippling pandemic? 
If he's not taking selfies and handing out money to his friends or ostracizing strong women or painting his body and face with black paint, Trudeau certainly doesn't demonstrate much competence. If people wonder why we have to deal with more restrictions to our freedoms due to COVID, it's because of the utter failure of the federal Liberal government. The Trudeau Liberals' inability to protect Canadians and refusal to support our own vaccine product creation is a real travesty, in my opinion. The Honourable Member for Airdrie Cochrane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A campaign promise fulfilled by this government centered around the defence and advocacy of Alberta's resource sectors. Defence from radical groups, activists and, yes, political parties hell-bent on spreading misinformation about vital industries that are the economic engines of this province. Now that the previous government sits in opposition, Albertans get to witness the true motives of the NDP, motives and actions against our energy, timber and agriculture sectors. These motives fly in the face of job creation for the people of this province. They want to keep Albertans down. They want to keep Alberta workers unemployed. They support the Trudeau Liberals in their desire to introduce or to intrude on our economic freedom. So let's shine a light on their deception, Mr. Speaker. During estimates, the NDP put forth an amendment intending to remove the entire $27 million energy industry advocacy budget, including the closing of the Canadian Energy Centre. The NDP cannot hide their disdain for industry. Their outright refusal to defend our resource sectors is indicative of that fact. Those that sit in this chamber with no threat of losing their jobs, protected at this time of COVID and economic turmoil, they are the lucky ones. But the VAC truck drivers, the engineers, the service companies and the rig operators, well, they, they appreciate the advocacy and they are not protected and they appreciate a government fighting for their jobs and their livelihoods, rather than spending the day spewing lies about their industry on Twitter. No, Mr. Speaker, these workers are not protected, and that is exactly who the CEC is fighting for. This government proudly defends our responsibly developed and ethically produced resource sectors on behalf of those workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Hat. Mr. Speaker, the United Conservatives promised to address jarring issues in the K-12 school pr curriculum, and last week the Minister of Education unveiled the draft K-6 curriculum that has been in development for 18 months. Now, if we'd listened to the opposition, you'd think that this new curriculum would cause irreparable damage to our children's learning. This outlandish belief leads me to believe that the NDP may not have even read the new curriculum, but judging from the previous teaching program, I doubt they did the last one either. I'll try to dispel some of those myths today. Alberta schools will be focused on teaching the essential knowledge and skills needed to reclaim our place as a world leader in education. The new curriculum focuses on literacy, using phonics, laying a solid foundation for building a child's entire education, but focusing on numeracy. Students are set for success with essential knowledge for everyday life, like budgeting and the value of a dollar, while preparing them for future, more complex learning. This type of financial literacy hasn't been present in our school curriculum before, and I think it's long overdue. Further, our future leaders will be taught all of our province and country's diverse history and context. Our children will learn all about diverse cultural and Indigenous heritage that built this great land while learning about the hard truths that we work so earnestly not to repeat. Alberta students will learn about the ultimate sacrifice that over 120,000 Canadians paid for our freedoms, the significance of Orange Shirt Day, and the people of colour who have been instrumental in making Alberta one of the best places in the world. Essential learning like the importance of consent replaces Extinction Rebellion. Household budgeting, business planning, and a focus on STEM takes the place of failed experiments like discovery math, partisan calls to action, and the refusal to even mention Alberta by name. Thank you to the Minister of Education for her tireless efforts and the experts who wrote this course material. Alberta's children have a bright future indeed, armed with this common sense curriculum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Members, it is time for oral question period. And the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, has the call. Yesterday, 17 members of the formerly United Conservative Government Caucus told Albertans that laws don't matter, that public health orders designed to save lives are an annoyance. This includes MLAs who represent some of the worst COVID-19 hotspots in our province. Mr. Speaker, to you and through you, to the government, what does it say about the government's ability to lead us through a global pandemic when a quarter of the Government Caucus refuses to be the leaders they need to be and follow the law? Well, Mr. Speaker, what that question says about the NDP is they continue to make things up and misrepresent the facts. Uh, members of this assembly 
are elected to represent their constituents and in this democracy to speak their minds. Mr. Speaker, uh, no member of this place has called for people to disregard the law or to engage in civil dis disobedience. And if the NDP is actually concerned about that, then why would they invent such a claim when it's not supported by the facts? Mr. Speaker, this government has acted and will continue to act uh, to protect lives and livelihoods, to protect our health care system, and will continue to do the right thing. The Honourable Member for edmonton -Winara. The member for West Yellowhead posted that he used to live on the coast, that he's seen waves and he's experienced ripples. He claims COVID-19's third wave is a ripple. The Premier knows that a thousand people or more will soon be in hospital. Hundreds more will be sick, at home, and people will die. The COVID forecast is not a ripple. If anything, it's a tsunami warning. Will the Premier set the record straight, tell the people of West Yellowhead that their MLA is wrong, and tell Albertans that this isn't a ripple, that they must follow the rules to save lives. Mr. Speaker, I've been urging Albertans to uh, carefully follow the public health measures for the past year. Uh, and we, I've reiterated the urgency of that in the context of this very serious uh, wave that we are now experiencing, not just here, but across many parts of the world. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we need to, and here's the message for people who are frustrated and impatient. We're very close to the end of this thing. If we can just stick to our guns, observe these rules for the next few weeks, we'll be able to get out of this thanks to the vaccines. The Honourable Member. Maybe the uh, Premier should start by telling his actual caucus that. The Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has lost control. He has proven to be a weak and ineffective leader. One quarter of his caucus, and counting, is deliber deliberately misleading the public about the real threat of COVID-19. They are the problem. Their denial of this is serious, and it will lead to longer shutdowns, more harm to businesses, and more Albertans will die. To the Premier, will the Premier grow a backbone, do the right thing, and force these MLAs to apologize and correct the record? And if they won't, will he kick each and every one of them out of the government? A point of order is noted at 152. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, democratic debate on public policy does not constitute a threat to public health or people's lives. And I'll tell you what is weak leadership, Mr. Speaker. Weak leadership is the kind of leadership that feels so threatened by different views that uh, leaders kick people out of their caucus or the government like the leader of the opposition did. She could brook no that she was so weak as Premier. She couldn't tolerate a single MLA speaking against government policy on a single issue. Mr. Speaker, we defend parliamentary democracy while doing the right thing to keep people safe during this pandemic. The Honourable Ed Member for Edmonton Glenora. Yet the Premier is not. The verdict is also in from teachers on this Premier and his new curriculum. It's fatally flawed. 90% of teachers, the professionals that we employ to train the next generation of Albertans, are opposed to teaching this backwards curriculum. And yet the Premier persists. He boasts that his curriculum has widespread, overwhelming support, which there is absolutely no evidence to substantiate. Albertans are overwhelmingly telling him that this will set kids back. To the Premier, will you finally admit that there is an overwhelming opposition to your UCP curriculum and pull the pilot? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, unions can have polls, but we had a big, big Democratic poll in April of 2019. It was called a general election. This government was elected with the largest mandate in Alberta here, history, here. over a million votes, and one of the key issues in that campaign explicitly addressed in this government's platform was to, to stop the NDP's ideological curriculum to uh, consult broadly and transparently on a renewed curriculum, Mr. Speaker, that would focus on good, strong outcomes in areas like literacy, numeracy, and civic literacy. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora. The Premier has failed to deliver on any key pillars within his mandate. This curriculum moves backwards, and it is a mess. 95% of principals, those who are entrusted to run our schools, oppose this failed curriculum. If you only got 5% on a test right, that wouldn't just be a fail, Premier, that would be a hard fail, an embarrassment, a clear demonstration that you didn't even try to meet the challenge. To the Premier, how can he possibly move forward with this minister's disastrous curriculum when school leaders are so dead set against it? Here, here. The Honourable Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, we know that many in the education policy establishment got it completely wrong on the disastrous experiment of discovery math in particular and inquiry learning generally. This government got our marching orders from ordinary Albertans, over a million of them, who endorsed our platform that said we would put an end to the obsessive focus on the failed experiment of discovery uh, math and, and inquiry learning. We've done that. We've brought forward a curriculum based on widespread input, including from teachers, Mr. Speaker. We will make revisions based on constructive criticism. The Honourable Member. This past summer, more than 90% of doctors expressed their no confidence in the current Minister of Health, which led the current Premier to declare him the finest minister in Alberta's history. And today, we have more than 90% of teachers expressing no confidence in what's supposed to be the current Minister of Education's chief accomplishment the content students are supposed to learn in Alberta schools. It's another resounding declaration that this current government has lost the confidence of healthcare and education professionals. To the Premier, teachers and principals have given a failing grade to this minister. Will he finally put this curriculum off the table? And if he won't, will he pull his Honourable minister? The Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, just today, one of the country's leading experts on math instruction, Professor Bika at the University of Manitoba said, that quotes, this is the first math curriculum I like. This is a game changer uh, by focusing on nuts and bolts. Mr. Speaker, the NDP defended the failure of, of a decade of decline in math outcomes in this province and of literacy outcomes. Albertans won't have it. That's why they gave us marching orders to bring back tried, true, and tested teaching methods. That's what this curriculum is about. And it is, of course, open to constructive suggestions for improvement. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mass spread COVID. Kids are washing their hands too much. We're too risk averse when it comes to COVID. Those are just some of the claims made by UCP MLAs as part of their mission to diminish the consequences of this deadly pandemic, which has cost over 2,000 deaths. The Premier has refused to condemn or even rebuke these reckless, fat free claims coming from his own backbench. Now, this variant driven third wave is extremely dangerous, and the last thing Albertans need is UCP MLAs diminishing the severity of this pandemic. Will the Premier finally repudiate the false claims this caucus has kept making about this pandemic? Here, here. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, what is it that the so called New Democratic Party does not understand about democracy? Mr. We do not, Mr. Speaker, there is a diverse range of views about how governments should best respond to the threat and challenge of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, to suggest that we should have no tolerance for different views about how best to address it is undemocratic. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, the government is responsible for taking decisions based on science, data, and, the, and expert advice from the chief medical officer. That's exactly what we've done to protect lives and livelihoods. It's what we will continue to do. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Mr. Speaker, the facts are that 17 MLAs in the UCP caucus have revolted against this Premier and the public health measures, and they are failing their constituents. That includes the member for Athabasca Barhead, whose constituency has the highest case rate per capita in the province. 14% of the students at Edwin Parr School in his area have COVID-19. Will the Premier perhaps explain why that member should still be the MLA for Athabasca Barhead when his claim that COVID-19 isn't a real threat ignores that 2% of the people he represents are infected, including 100 kids at a single school in his constituents. Wow. The Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I haven't heard any member of this place denying the reality or the threat of COVID. What I have heard some members say is that the uh, public health restrictions have been extremely painful and have had their own negative consequences, including not just in financial ruin for many people, but mental and, and emotional health uh, crises as well. You know, that's why the government has sought to to find, strike a balance between the protection of lives, the health care system, but also to minimize those negative effects. It would be nice for the NDP to stand up for once and acknowledge the people who are hurting because of these restrictions. Here, here. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I stand daily on behalf of Albertans, and that's why I'm calling out the member of Lacombe Pinoca, who sent out an email talking about his fight with public health officials and accusing them of being obsessed with fear. But while that member plots how to defeat the people on the front lines fighting this pandemic, he seems to have forgotten that Pinoca County, which he represents, has the second highest case rate in the province. Will the Premier agree to sit down with the member from Lacombe Pinoca, the member from Athabasca Barhead, maybe the 15 others in his caucus that are undermining the public health of this province, explain to them that COVID-19 is real and people in their constituencies are getting sick 
and dying. Here, here. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think ev I know that every member of this place understands the real menace of this uh, lethal pandemic. But we can look around the world at different democratically elected governments. Right next door in British Columbia, Mr. Speaker, generally, that NDP government has had less severe restrictions than Alberta has for most of the past several months. So naturally, there is a legitimate and necessary debate about how best to tackle the pandemic without causing widespread damage to society. At the end of the day, this government makes the right to calls based on expert advice. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South. Among the 17 UCP MLAs openly advocating to break the law when it comes to COVID-19 is the member for Grand Prairie who once served as the Minister of Municipal Affairs. She was in charge of the vaccine rollout. She was head of emergency management for months during this pandemic. And as it shockingly turns out, she's not scared of COVID and believes the public health orders are unnecessary. To the Premier, did you know your former minister and head of emergency management actually doesn't think COVID-19 is a serious threat? And does the Premier even vet these people? The Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure what that has to do with government business, first of all. Secondly, uh, the, I, I would refer the member to the statements made by the member for Grand Prairie after she suffered through COVID herself about what a serious threat it is. Thirdly, n n neither that member nor any member of this place has counsel counseled people to violate the law, and it is frankly defamatory to suggest otherwise. I look forward to the member opposite standing up, retracting, and apologizing for that gross defamatory falsehood. Yeah, yeah. Member. 17 members of this Premier's caucus are in open revolt. The only reason this member for Grand Prairie is no longer in Cabinet is because she was caught travelling in Hawaii over Christmas while the vast majority of Albertans followed public health orders and stayed home. It's only conceivable that this minister was in cabinet briefings where the chief medical officer of health would have detailed just how serious COVID-19 is and the great pain and suffering it's causing. To the premier, do cabinet ministers even pay attention in public health briefings? Perhaps the minister was too busy on Expedia booking flights to Honolulu. The Honourable the Premier. I'm afraid I had some difficulty hearing the question, Mr. Speaker. I, I will just reiterate that uh, ministers, particularly those, who are members of the Emergency Management Committee or uh, different committees that have dealt with COVID are acutely aware of the, of the issues, of the data, of the threat. We have spent collectively hundreds of hours uh, studying the issue, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, looking at every possible response to keep people safe while minimizing the impact of restrictions on our broader society. Unlike the NDP that just wants to shut everything down, violate every right and freedom, and close every business. The Honourable Member. Those very ministers are now signing letters that say not to follow the rules. The Aloha Gate scandal damaged Albertans' faith in public health orders and in this government. Now we see the minister at the very centre of it never believed COVID-19 is real or serious. People are dying. We need real leadership. To the Premier. Has the government confirmed that every single member of the current cabinet understands the threat of COVID-19, believes in the science, and supports the public health orders? If not, will the Premier identify the COVID deniers in his cabinet right now, here and today? Here, here. Uh, not entirely sure what the purpose of the question with respect to government business or policy was. Uh, if the Premier would like to respond, he's welcome to do so. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member just reiterated a defamatory falsehood. He accused a member of this place of having signed letters instructing people not to follow the law. Mr. Speaker, that is manifestly untrue. You yourself should know that, Mr. Speaker, because you signed the letter. Would you please correct the minister, or the member? Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've received hundreds of emails and phone calls from my constituents about the government's decision to rescind the 1976 coal policy. The eastern slopes are a beautiful and a breathtaking place, and many of my constituents are worried that coal development could negatively impact the environment, our drinking water, and our ag industry. Could the Minister of Energy please explain what the government is doing to properly consult and hear from residents of my constituency and other Albertans? Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Albertans have told our government loud and clear they want to say in how the province will manage coal development. 
Uh, we've appointed a committee composed of Albertans with varying perspectives on coal development to lead an independent, transparent engagement process. The committee is ultimately responsible for designing and conducting the engagement and ensuring the voices of all interested Albertans are heard. It will, it will provide the Minister of Energy with a report by November 15th that describes Albertans' perspectives on coal development and provide recommendations to the Minister about the province's development of a modern coal policy. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Given that many of my constituents feel like they were not properly consulted before the 76 coal policy was rescinded, and given that there are many diverse voices in Livingston McLeod that deserve to be heard and consulted with, including members of the Pecani First Nation, can the same minister let us know how the members of the Coal Policy Committee, Committee were chosen and how these members reflect the diversity of opinions on this issue? Member or Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The committee members offer a wide range of perspectives on coal development and conservation of Alberta's, Alberta's landscapes. Through outreach with multiple stakeholders over the past weeks, the committee members were chosen from amongst eastern slopes to represent a broad set of skills and experiences. The Coal Policy Committee includes an internationally recognized expert in environmental assessment and monitoring, a former Alberta Environment Minister, the Executive Director of the Hinton and District Chamber of Commerce, the President of the Livingston Landowners Group, and a member of the Pecani Nation, who is also a small business owner. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that Albertans can voice their opinions on the Coal Policy Thirst Survey until April 19th, and given that this survey is only the beginning of a lengthy and comprehensive consultation process. Once again, can the Minister of Energy please explain what the next steps are after April 19th and what the government will do with the recommendations of the committee? Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Thanks, is Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member for their advocacy. The engagement process led by the committee will be widespread and comprehensive. It will begin with the initial survey to help determine the committee's uh, design of future engagement. The committee will take the time to hear a wide range of perspectives and begin scheduling stakeholder meetings immediately. In addition, we will also begin engagement with Indigenous leaders and other communities. It's important to remember that the development of the 76 coal policy was such a lengthy process because it was developed from scratch. This engagement and the resulting work on a modern coal policy will build on the knowledge gained from the existing policy and the regulatory system. The Honourable Member for Calgary McCall is next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While my constituents were working tirelessly in frontline essential jobs throughout this pandemic, the Premier blamed them for having large families and smaller homes. The Premier is silent now in actually condoning the action of 17 UCP MLAs who are actively undermining public health orders. Will the Premier stop blaming my constituents for spreading the COVID-19 and take action against his MLAs who are spreading inaccurate information that could get people killed? The Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, another uh, false and misleading defamatory question from the NDP. I have, as I've said repeatedly, no one is to blame for COVID-19. No one is to, nobody does anything purposely to infect other people. Uh, it is true that we've seen uh, evidence of growing non-compliance with public health measures, and I encourage the NDP to join with us in encouraging all Albertans in all parts of the provinces, province, from all backgrounds, carefully to follow those public health measures to get this thing under control. The Honourable Member for Calgary McCall. Given that all my constituents have gotten from this Premier is insults and allegations that they were not taking the threats of virus seriously, but given that it's actually one quarter of the Premier's caucus that thinks COVID-19 is a joke, even though 2,000 Albertans have died and more than 155,000 have gotten sick, to the Premier, will you finally apologize to my constituents and will you admit the real problem with taking the virus seriously lie in your own ranks. The Honourable Premier. But Mr. Speaker, I'm really having a hard time with this line of NDP questioning today because they, they claim that statements from members calling COVID fake and a joke and encouraging people not to follow the rules will create a problem with public perception. But no MLAs have said those things. All of those are false claims invented by the NDP. If they're actually concerned if they're actually concerned about the educational role that elected officials play, then why are they completely fabricating the position of members who recognize the threat of COVID, but also the, the impact of, of health restrictions? The Honourable Member. 
Given that member from ADRIES told Albertans that they are not alone in the fight against public health restrictions, and given that not following those restrictions risks the lives of my constituents and Albertans who are performing essential work during this pandemic. To the Premier, explain to my constituents and Albertans why you are willing to risk them getting sick and dying so you can save political face in your crumbling caucus. The Honourable Premier. Well, it never, it never takes them very long, Mr. Speaker, of accusing Conservatives of wanting people to die. What pathetic gutter politics that is beneath this institution, Mr. Speaker. What they are so obsessed with is the notion that this is a, a vibrant democracy where elected representatives may have different views on critical matters of public policy. None of that uh, subordinates the government's responsibility to uh, do the right thing based on expert advice and the scientific evidence to protect lives and livelihoods. Would they please stop lying about their fellow members of this place? Point of order. The, point of order a point of order is noted at 2.11. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Whitemud. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, the UCP announced new public health restrictions that will have an impact on businesses and workers in this province. After weeks of thumping his chest and proclaiming he wouldn't bring in restrictions, the Premier did just that. Understandably, businesses were shocked and caught off guard by the Premier's about face, especially since the restrictions he announced didn't come with any support for the small businesses and workers that will be directly affected. To the Premier, why didn't the government have supports for workers and small businesses ready to go in time for new public health measures? Why does it seem the government had no clue a third wave of COVID was coming? Here, here. Well, the the Premier. Another NDP falsehood, or several of them, we, I've never said that we would not bring in further restrictions, Mr. Speaker. I said that if it was necessary, we would do so. And that remains the case. Should it be necessary for additional measures uh, to protect our health care system and people's lives? With respect to business support, we have provided billions of dollars of support, half a billion in cash grants, uh, and we. Uh, hundreds of millions in WCB abatement, in, in participation in the federal commercial rent subsidy, and so much more. Mr. Speaker, will, there will be additional cash support for those businesses affected by this week's announcement. The order, the Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud. Given that the Small and Medi Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant closed on March 31st, and given that it's been replaced with the enhanced COVID-19 business benefit, but applications don't even open until mid-April, and when they do open, the benefit is half as much as the previous program, under much stricter criteria that doubles the amount of lost revenue required to qualify. To the Premier, will the government reopen the Small and Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant that will give small businesses access to direct and immediate financial support instead of leaving them in limbo while the government finishes designing a completely new and much worse program? Here, here. The Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the program to which the member just referred is designed specifically to assist those businesses most heavily hit. Uh, by public health restrictions over the past year. There's a very small category of businesses who were largely suspended, like dance studios, uh, for example, for most of the past year. We wanted to have a special program focused on those who have sacrificed the most, but uh, the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation is working with the Minister of Finance to bring forward expeditiously a, an additional cash package uh, for those businesses affected by this week's uh, public health measures. The Honourable Member. Well, given that's cold comfort to the thousands of Alberta businesses that are affected right now, and given that the UCP took nine months to roll out the critical worker benefit only to exclude thousands upon thousands of frontline workers that were deemed too essential to be sent home and yet not critical enough to receive help from this government. And given that this government already let thousands of workers fall through the cracks with their emergency isolation benefit, to the Premier, will this government adopt our proposal for a third wave emergency response benefit that will support workers through this wave of COVID cases and prevent even more working Albertans from falling through the cracks? Here, here. The Honourable Premier. Well, the, the member should know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, with respect to workers affected by by the pandemic that the federal government continues to have the enhanced employment insurance COVID benefit available. Uh, it, uh, for, as for all provinces, including the NDP government of BC, has taken the lead on that side of the economic response. Our focus is on the small and medium-sized businesses so they survive and get through this, can hire those people back. And that's why we'll be making an announcement in the days to come about additional support uh, for those struggling enterprises. The Honourable Member for Lesser Slave Lake. Mr. Speaker, functional and safe roads are the sinew of a healthy economy and they are the lifeblood of constituencies like Lesser Slave Lake where distant communities can remain linked and engage in seamless transit and commerce. 
Many in my constituency, however, are concerned about the state of our roads they drive on. Yeah. Several constituents have even sent me bills for repairing their vehicles while driving in the riding. To the Honourable Minister of Transportation, what, ministers are being take, what measures are being taken to help the repair critical infrastructure in Lesser Slave Lake, vital to the ongoing connection of the community, which needs to be improved? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, every Albertan should be able to get around the province safely and efficiently, especially without damaging their vehicle. Through Budget 2021, we're focused on fixing and upgrading many of our existing roads and bridges. Our government is investing $1.5 billion over the next three years in capital maintenance and renewal, funding to improve and repair key roads, highways, bridges, and other infrastructure in our province. We've already begun work on repaving sections of Highway 2 and Highway 679, as well as the other bridge replacements on, on the right-of-way maintenance work. This will make roads safer, create jobs, and help Albertans get around more efficiently, including in the Honourable Member's writing. The Honourable Member for Lesser Slave Lake. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Given that the roads in my constituency of Lesser Slave Lake see intensive use from commercial logging and yeah. industrial traffic, which puts the roads under additional strain, and given that the resource is necessary to repair these intensively used roads has thus far been lacking, can the Honourable Minister of Transport comment as to if he has any plans to tackle the pothole epidemic in the Lesser Slave Lake region? The Honourable the Minister of Transportation, Municipal well, thanks, Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, we're uh, prioritizing repaving projects on key highways, including our primary trade corridors that save our, serve our energy sector to support industry and to help Alberta goods get to market. Under Budget 2021, we will pave 36 kilometres of Highway 2, 20 kilometres of Highway 679 in the Slave Lake region. By preemptively investing in maintenance, we will dramatically reduce the need for expensive infrastructure repairs in the future and support companies and residents in the region. Our $1.5 billion investment will go towards more than 260 other capital maintenance renewal projects as well. The order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Lesser Slave Lake. Mr. Speaker, given that portions of Provincial Highway 88 go straight through Saw Ridge First Nations treaty ter territory under terms of Treaty 8, and given that Saw Ridge First Nation is still seeking compensation from the province for the land provided to enable Provincial Highway 88's initial construction, so, to the Honourable Minister, has any progress been made in resolving this issue, and if not, when? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Whenever Alberta transportation needs land for a highway project, we take seriously our treaty obligations and positive relationships with Indigenous communities, and this is no exception. I can hardly hear myself say the question, Mr. Speaker. Alberta transportation officials are currently working with our partners and other departments to support our relationship with the Saw Ridge First Nation. While I can't provide the member with any specifics at this time, we hope to reach out to the nation very soon and uh, make progress on this important highway project and past issues. The order, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, West Hinde. This government constantly claims to support Alberta businesses, but the businesses in my community are telling a completely different story, Mr. Speaker. The third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing in-room dining to be closed again and will put more focus on takeout and delivery. But we know some of the delivery apps that local restaurants rely on charge fees of up to 30% on the total order. Minister, food delivery will become the primary source of income for so many restaurants again this weekend. Will you finally cap the fees charged by third-party delivery apps at 15 percent as we've seen in other jurisdictions. The Honourable Member for Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. We've worked with various members, various companies that provide delivery services, Mr. Speaker, and they did the responsible thing. They put in place additional measures to make sure they help the restaurants here in Alberta. They need to have those restaurants be thriving and vibrant, Mr. Speaker, in order to have customers for their businesses. We're going to continue to work with the private sector to come up with solutions. But also, Mr. Speaker, we want to be there to support restaurants during this pandemic. That's why we've had the relaunch grant. Over 70,000 businesses, Mr. Speaker, in Alberta took advantage of that program. More supports are coming due to these new health measures as well. Order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Hyundai. 
Given that on February 3rd, the Alberta Business Improvement Area Alliance called for the government to put the cap on third party delivery fees, and given that we have heard from so many restaurants and small businesses that are supportive of this move, and given that implementing the cap may require legislation, legislation that the official opposition would be happy to develop and expedite passage through this House, Minister, will you bring forward a bill to cap delivery fees before the rise of this spring session, or will you continue to leave our struggling restaurants to get hammered by hefty? Fees. The Honourable Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to be there to support small business owners across this province. Our relaunch grant, Mr. Speaker, is one of the most successful business supports in the entire country, Mr. Speaker, a 10-day turnaround. We're going to provide additional supports as well for restaurants and other small businesses so they can get to the other side of this pandemic. But, Mr. Speaker, I think that this NDP line of questioning is just indicative of their strategy, Mr. Speaker. If it moves, regulate it, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. I had no problem hearing the Honourable Member from Edmonton West 10 days, but because of the shouting from the back row, I'm having some challenge hearing the Minister. The order. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is its typical NDP. If it moves... The Honourable Member for Edmonton Goldbar knows that the use of first names inside the chamber, whether on the record or off the record, are wildly inappropriate. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we must have touched a nerve because the NDP just simply want to regulate everything that moves, Mr. Speaker. If it walks, regulate it. If it talks, regulate it. Mr. Speaker, that's just the NDP. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Henday. Given that delivery is not the only part of the process where these apps add on fees for the restaurants, there are also fees restaurants have to pay for the processing of online ordering, and given the BIA Alliance is also calling for a cap on these fees, which are causing restaurants to lose an even higher percentage of their revenue from online orders, will the government implement a 5% cap on service fees for using third-party apps and also bring that measure forward while this legislator is sitting this spring? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I go back to my other line of answer, Mr. Speaker. Again, the NDP strategy here, regulate, regulate, regulate. They don't trust businesses, Mr. Speaker. They don't, truck. They don't deal with innovation, Mr. Speaker. The NDP purport to be supportive of innovation, Mr. Speaker. We are at the forefront of venture capital investment in Alberta, job growth and technology. Technology impacts every business, from agriculture to restaurants, small businesses, energy, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to stifle innovation, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to regulate every single thing in society like the NDP like to do, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be there to support small businesses, though. The order, order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. I hope uh, the Minister of Education is brushing up on her math skills because the number of school boards refusing to pilot her backwards curriculum is adding up. The latest include Medicine Hat Public and Catholic Divisions, where a local superintendent called this curriculum developmentally inappropriate and said it would be a challenge for the school system to function well. So how many school boards have to renounce this Premier's failed curriculum before he'll admit his mistakes and go back to the drawing board? 10? 20? All of them? The Honourable the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, in, tw in 2019, the curriculum was a major campaign commitment to the people of Alberta. And I am so grateful that this government delivered on that major party platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we, you know, we, th this is the most transparently you know, concluded curriculum in the history of our province. We have, uh, we have a curriculum advisory panel, and we have advisors from across the board. We have two black professors from the University of Alberta. Mr. Speaker, I am so grateful that the Minister of Education had enough to put this curriculum forward. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Given that eight school boards have now refused to pilot this new curriculum because it's so flawed, the Métis Nation of Alberta has called for this unacceptable curriculum to be withdrawn and rewritten. The Confederacy of Treaty Six Nations have called this curriculum faulty and incomplete and stated that, I quote, it perpetuates rather than addresses systemic racism. And Alberta's teachers have now delivered their verdict, giving it a huge thumbs down. Will the minister revise and resubmit her homework, or will she really press ahead with a curriculum that has no support from Treaty 6, the Métis Nation, teachers, school boards, parents, students, the list goes on. Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud that this is the first curriculum in Alberta's history 
that will teach black history, indigenous history, all kinds of religions from Christianity to Islam, you know, you know, you name it. You know, the reason why the NDP are so pissed off is that we did not allow them to write the curriculum in secret. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you know, we have more than a hundred, you know, teachers who worked on this particular curriculum. I am so proud that finally this curriculum will teach about black history and achievement in our province. Point of order is noted at 2.25, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Wow. Uh, given uh, that uh, the, the, the Minister of Justice would be uh, quite uh, benefited if he actually looked at the current curriculum, which uh, very much uh, talks about Indigenous history and Indigenous perspectives, and given that it's not just school boards, Indigenous leaders and deans that are pushing back against this curriculum, it's parents as well, we've seen a surge of Albertans come together to powerfully and eloquently share their views with this Minister, only to see her cast their concerns aside. So what's it going to take for this Minister of Education, this government, to drop their incorrect talking points, confront reality, respect Albertans, and fix the broken curriculum? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker the, good, the good news is that we have a website out there, albera.ca slash curriculum, whereby Alberta parents, all Albertans, can go online right now and provide their substantive feedback. But, Mr. Speaker, what we would not take is the NDP activism over our children. As a parent of three school-age children, I know when I say a good curriculum. Mr. Speaker, it was education that brought me to, the, um, to this very chambers. I know the value of education, and I'm so grateful to the Minister of Education for this curriculum. The Honourable Member for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Volunteers are the driving force behind the recreational, social, and cultural programs that make our communities great. In fact, for my constituency of Spruce Grove and Stony Plain, we have had several volunteers recognized for their efforts. Just last year, Amanda Hardman of Stony Plain was recognized for her dedication to 4-H, STEM advocacy, and, work on, and her work on several rural youth councils. And I'm so proud of the efforts of our dedicated volunteers across the province and my riding. To the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and Status of Women, what is your ministry doing to celebrate the efforts of Alberta's extraordinary volunteers? The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you to the member for this question. Volunteers are the foundation for many community organizations in providing recreational, social, and cultural programming. I'm very happy to announce that the call for nominations for the 2021 Stars of Alberta Awards is now open. The Stars of Alberta Awards highlight and pay tribute to volunteers who give their time, energy, and skills to make a difference in the lives of Albertans. We have seen so many people across our province volunteering to help their communities without hesitation. Albertans can nominate exceptional volunteers in their community until September 15, 2021. The Honourable Member for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for answer. Given that volunteerism occurs, ac occurs across sectors, age groups, and communities, and given that Alberta has more than 26,400 nonprofit organizations, and given that each year more than 1.6 million Albertans provide more than 262 million volunteer hours to support the nonprofit and voluntary sector at a value of $5.6 billion to the same minister, how does the Stars of Alberta Volunteers award Awards recognize the diversity in the volunteer sector? The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, Albertans can nominate a star volunteer in four different categories, which include youth, adult, senior, and breaking barriers. The breaking barriers category was just introduced last year and recognizes exceptional volunteers who are working to create resilient, connected communities that are diverse and inclusive. Volunteers are eligible for the breaking barriers category if they address racism or reduce barriers for racialized communities, increase and promote intercultural understanding and trust between communities, fight gender discrimination and reduce barriers for women, girls and gender diverse people. The Honourable Member for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you to the Minister for your answer. Given that now more than ever, volunteers have stepped up to help their neighbours and communities, and given that Alberta's volunteers are active throughout the entire year, and that every day there are more and more ways that they can help their respective communities, and further, given that Alberta's volunteers and volunteer organizations often look for new ways to connect and support their fellow Albertans to the same minister, what other programs or recognitions are available for volunteers here in our province? The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. 
Mr. Speaker, volunteers are everyday heroes whose simple acts of kindness make a lasting difference in the lives of their neighbours and friends. The Ministry of Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women launched the Alberta Cares Connector on April 22, 2020, and it served more than 567,000 individuals with more than 2.2 million searches in their volunteer journey, resulting in more than 65,000 matches of volunteers to opportunities. To date, approximately 100 volunteers have been recognized. Again, I would like to remind everyone the nomination period for Stars of Alberta ends on September 15. So please share this information with your constituents. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Gold Bar. Yesterday, our leader introduced the Eastern Slopes Protection Act. This bill would implement the protections for our beautiful mountains and vital headwaters. If the government had actually consulted with Albertans before signing our Rocky Mountains over to coal mining companies from Australia, they'd know that Albertans are clearly in support of this kind of legislation. The government has now had sufficient time to review the legislation and it's a simple question. Will they support the bill? Why or why not? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. I guess the uh, Honourable Member is so excited he can't wait till the bill comes before this House, which would be the proper thing to do. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the fact is the, uh, our uh, Energy Minister is, uh, has a group leading a consultation uh, from, uh, for Albertans, for all Albertans, to talk about what the coal, future coal policy might be. Uh, that is uh, a great way for us to inform our, our government's opinion on this. We will be uh, seeing that process through. I think it's important to Albertans. Until the NDP once said that they thought it was a good idea, yet today they don't seem to want to wait for it. The Honourable Member for Evans Gold Bar. Well, given the Minister's consultation is totally bogus because, you know, it relies on a largely vague survey, and given that water allocation was left out of the Minister's bogus consultation on coal mining, and given that the Eastern Slopes Protection Act would require enhanced land use plans that would protect water and set specific rules for water allocation. If the Minister won't consult on how important preserving our waterways is, will she at least support the portion of our bill that enshrines land use plans? Or do our lands and water take a back seat when she can make a few bucks from Australian coal mining billionaires? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Municipal uh, Affairs. A, a point of order on the question, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the question was also riddled with uh, inaccuracies. The Environment Minister has made it very clear that the uh, water protection is in place. It's as strong as ever. Uh, the, energy, the Energy Minister has made it, made it clear that we will inform ourselves uh, uh, on a coal policy as, uh, through a very strong, legitimate public process that the Honourable Members across might even want to participate in if they actually cared about making the world better instead of just throwing stones. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I would uh, advise them to get involved in a constructive way. A point of order is noted at 2.32. The Honourable Member. Well, given we have made our contribution by bringing forward legislation to this House that the Minister apparently doesn't support, and given that Albertans wanting to weigh in on the dangers of coal mining and who want to protect our Rocky Mountains and vital waterways deserve more than a fake survey, and given that Albertan, uh, Alberta's NDP has consulted with thousands of Albertans before bringing forward the Eastern Slopes Protection Act, when will Albertans get to speak to the Minister directly about coal mining? Is she holding online meetings, or is she worried that she won't find a single supporter of this horrendous coal policy? The Honourable the Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. It's, uh, this is uh, typical NDP calling a policy terrible before it's developed. They don't even know what's going to be in it, and they've already decided they don't like it, which is completely consistent with the NDP's attitude, Mr. Speaker. They don't like anything. If you, if you do more, they don't like it. If you do less, they don't like it. If, if the Premier speaks at a press conference, he's hogging the mic. If he doesn't speak at a press conference, he's taking a day off work. Mr. Speaker, the, this is typical, proves the NDP's attitude. They're against anything constructive. They're against everything that matters to Albertans. It's very consistent. It's very disturbing, and they, they just demonstrated that. The order, the opposition House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, my colleague asked the Minister of Agriculture why information about food inspectors contracting COVID-19 while at the Cargill meatpacking plant was withheld from the workers there. The government House leader said he refused to politicize the situation. This is a matter of workers' safety, not partisan politics. This government chose to jeopardize the safety of workers when they withheld vital and potentially life-saving information. So I asked the Minister of Agriculture to put politics aside and to simply answer, why didn't he tell the workers at the Cargill plant about the 
the COVID-19 cases that inspectors caught at the work site. The Honourable Minister of Finance has risen. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and firstly, uh, this government certainly uh, extends any sympathies to uh, those food processing workers who, uh, who lost loved ones and, uh, and those families uh, who, who experienced great loss as a result of the challenges last spring. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, our Minister of Agriculture uh, has continued to take advice from public health officials throughout this whole process. We're committed to the safety of uh, agriculture manufacturer workers, and we're committed to the safety of all Albertans. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Given that three people died as a result of the Cargill COVID-19 outbreak, and given that the Minister of Agriculture was told about two inspectors contracting COVID-19 at the work site, and then chose not to tell Cargill workers about that knowledge two hours later on a conference call with them, and given that the Minister actually went further and insisted that the plant was safe when he had evidence that made clear it was not, will the Minister admit he was more interested in keeping the Cargill plant open than keeping those Alberta workers safe? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, worker safety continues to be a top priority for this government uh, throughout the pandemic. At all times, the government followed the expert medical advice of officials, including the Chief uh, Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw. And at no time did Alberta's health expert officials recommend the closure of food processing plants with respect to Cargill. <clears throat> Given that the UCP have continually not been transparent on the spread of COVID-19 in Cargill, and this is displayed right in front of us as the government continues to dodge our questions and the minister avoids media, and given that the truth was withheld from Cargill workers last April when the UCP provided a false sense of security on the conditions inside the plant, these workers and all Albertans deserve the truth now. Will the Minister of Agriculture commit to a full and transparent public inquiry into the spread of COVID-19 at the Cargill meatpacking plant? If not, will the Minister of Labour, will the Premier, will somebody over there stand up for the thousands of workers? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Speaker, this is the continued false narrative of the NDP to continue to undermine public confidence in our public health officials and the work that Dr. Hinshaw's office has done to continue to respond to the pandemic, as well as the folks in our office, the folks in the ministry, and the folks at AHS who are doing everything they can to protect the lives of Albertans throughout this pandemic. The NDP continue continue to try to undermine that public confidence in those folks. Those folks in the front line responding to this pandemic is shameful behaviour. I call on them to stop. The Honourable Member for Red Deer South. Mr. Speaker, I rise in good cheer. Red Deer has many blessings, a great location and a great people, a wonderful trail, river and park system. But Red Deer has no integrated shelter service for the homeless, many of whom are suffering with addictions and mental health challenges. Budget 2020 announced an integrated shelter service for Red Deer. Thanks to the Ministers of Community and Social Services and Seniors in Housing and Municipal Leaders. To the Minister, what is the status of the shelter service? The Honourable the Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government remains committed to supporting this project in Red Deer to address homelessness. Last week, the Minister of Seniors and Housing, the Ministers of Community and Social Services, the members from Red Deer North and South had a very productive meeting with Mayor Veer on this very question, which all support the community finding a local solution to address homelessness. Mr. Speaker, that is why we have asked the City of Red Deer in consultation with local MLAs and City Council to provide a locally supported proposal to make use of the $7 million in provincial funding for an integrated emergency shelter. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to plan and work with the community. The Honourable Member for Red Deer South. Given a lack of a shelter has resulted in rough sleeper camps in Red Deer parks and public spaces, impacting families and children, and given that this shelter service needs to be accountable, not only to the men and women it serves, but also as a good neighbour to families and businesses in the community. To the Minister, how can a shelter service which strives to be a good neighbour bless families and businesses in our community? The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, we know homelessness is a compounding serious issue for the City of Red Deer, and an overnight shelter is absolutely critical to addressing this ongoing problem. A shelter will give vulnerable people a safe place to stay with access to critical supports, including housing and addictions treatment. Ultimately, we want to ensure that vulnerable Albertans get the help they need while addressing the public safety and social disorder concerns from local businesses and the surrounding community. The Honourable Member. Given an integrated shelter service can be a place of hope where individuals receive help and support for mental health and other challenges to work towards freedom from addictions. And given this government, along with families and church volunteer organizations in our community, want to support, serve, and love their neighbours to improve their lives, including connection for mental health and freedom from addictions, to the Minister. How can this shelter bless the men and women it serves in our community? The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, homelessness has had a devastating impact on individuals and families across the province and across the country. A new integrated emergency shelter in Red Deer will provide critical overnight shelter and important day support such as meal service, showers, laundry and access to housing, mental health and addiction supports. Shelters are a necessary solution for many individuals in need of emergency housing and can be a connection to supports that will help people ultimately get into housing. Honourable Members, that concludes the time allotted for oral question period. In 30 seconds or less, we will return to the remainder of the daily routine. Presenting reports by standing and special committees. Presenting petitions. Notices of motions. Member for Edmonton Glenora. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I uh, rise to introduce, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 42, uh, I will propose the following motion when uh, the appropriate time be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly affirm the need to uphold and enforce all current public health measures now and prevent the spread of COVID-19 so that our businesses, our schools, our communities, and our economy as a whole can get back to normal and get back to work as soon as possible. Thank you. The Honourable the Associate Minister of, Rare, of Red Tape Reduction. Mr. Speaker, I request leave to introduce Bill 62, the Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2021. Bill 62 follows our government's previous work on reducing red tape by establishing greater efficiencies, faster approvals, and additional cost savings. This work could not be more important than right now. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to announce also that not only have we achieved our goal of cutting red tape by 12% by the end of this year, but we have exceeded it to 15.7%. What does that mean for Albertans? It means that Albertans have 105,000 less red tape hoops they have to jump through. 
We are quickly and carefully cutting in the unintended government strings that bind up and frustrate our jobs, job creators and everyday Albertans. I hereby move first reading of Bill 62, the Red Tape Production Implementation Act 2021. Honourable Members, the Associate Minister of Red Tape Reduction has moved first reading of Bill 62, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2021. All those in favour of the motion for first reading, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. Bill 62, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2021 is now read a first time. The Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm honoured to, uh, to rise and request leave to introduce Bill 65, the Health Statutes Amendment Act, Spring 2021. This bill is another step forward in our government's work to modernize and strengthen Alberta's health legislation to help ensure our health system can better serve Albertans and continue uh, to, to support improvement. The proposed amendments would focus on increasing system efficiencies, adapting and responding to changing needs, and using public dollars wisely. Together, these proposed amendments continue government's work to update our province's health legislation to better serve Albertans and operate more efficiently. I hereby move first reading of the Health Statutes Amendment Act, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable the Minister of Health has moved first reading of Bill 65, Health Statutes Amendment Act 2021. All those in favour of the motion for first reading, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. Bill 65, Health Statutes Amendment Act 2021, Health Amendment Act 2021 is now read a first time. Tabling returns and reports. Are there tablings? Seeing none. Tablings to the clerk, deferred divisions. Honourable members, we are at points of order and at 152. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader rose on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At, uh, if I uh, heard it correctly, the Honourable Member in, uh, said something to the effect that the Premier is deliberately misleading the public. Uh, under 23 H I and J, it's making allegations against another member. I think it's extremely clearly not allowed here. And I would appreciate it if you would ask the Honourable Member to uh, apologize and withdraw a remark that I'm almost certain the Honourable Member knows they should not have made. The Opposition House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have access to the Blues, and so I will rely on uh, your access to the Blues and good judgment. Uh, based on the uh, questions that I have in my hands, the Member did not. Uh, refer to the Premier in that way, but uh, I will allow you to uh, reflect on the Blues and uh, render your verdict. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for the interjections. I have a, I'm sure I'll make a number of points today uh, on a number of issues. Um, I have spoken at some length uh, about implying uh, members are lying and, and particularly uh, around uh, deliberately misleading and um, the blues I have the benefit of. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has lost control of his caucus. He has proven to be a weak and ineffective leader. One quarter of his caucus and counting is, continue, is deliberately misleading the public. And that's the real threat to COVID-19. And then they go on and the point of order is called. I would say uh, in the strongest possible of terms, um, and, and I'll refer to it in later rulings around the use of the word lying, uh, and I'll speak to um, a point of order that was missed during member statements as well. Um, that when we use language like a group of members are deliberately misleading, uh, it's very similar to last week when I ruled the word lying out of order. And so, well, uh, at this point in time, 
on this particular point of order, and I, I think perhaps I'll take a slightly different position on uh, subsequent points of order that we hear this afternoon, I'm not going to find this comment out of order, but I will provide the same sort of caution that I did last week with respect to the use of the word lying. Um, and when we are saying that a group of people inside the chamber are deliberately misleading, uh, that that will create disorder and uh, will eventually uh, be ruled out of order, if not today. Uh, that is the first point of order. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. Last week, I referred specifically to the use of the word lying and uh, making accusations that a group of people, caucus government or otherwise, uh, is doing so. The Honourable Member for Airdrie Cochrane did make that assertion during his member statement. And so I'd like to ask, call upon the Deputy Government House Leader to withdraw and apologize on his behalf. Mr. Speaker, I will be happy, based on your advice, to uh, withdraw and apologize on the Honourable Member's behalf. Consider both matters dealt with and concluded. We are at point of order number two when the uh, official uh, Deputy uh, government House Leader rose at 2.01 in response to the member for Edmonton South uh, South's question. The Honourable Member. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, under 23 H.I. and J. making allegations against another member. Uh, and if I heard it correctly, it says those very mi ministers signed a letter uh, suggesting people don't follow government guidelines or to essentially break the law. I'd, I'd, uh, I think that is... Uh, assigning false motives. A uh, second part of this, it, and again, Mr. Speaker, I apologize, I don't have the details in front of me, but if the Honourable Member was referring to other members in this House that were not in government, that's out of order because, of course, question period is to question us on government policy, not on the behaviour of private members. Official Opposition House Leader. Much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I don't have the benefit of the blues, but uh, I would suggest this is not a point of order, but a matter of debate. Uh, we are having a really important conversation that impacts the public health of Albertans, uh, where MLAs have signed a letter that includes the quote, we do not support the additional restrictions imposed on Albertans yesterday. Uh, and as part of our debate on this issue on policy, uh, certainly the members of the official opposition would suggest that statements such as this undermine the trust and compliance in public health orders will have serious ramifications uh, and seem to be a continuation of a pattern of behaviour from this government in the past. I suggest that this is a matter of debate uh, and I would also articulate that I have seen through social media and correspondence that should I ask uh, a number of health professionals, doctors, uh, other public health officials if they feel that this letter undermines trust and compliance in public health orders, I suggest I would find a number of people who agree with our position. Uh, are there others? Thank you for your interjections or your uh, submissions on this particular point of order. And uh, I would say that I find this point of order different than the previous one uh, with respect to uh, making accusations about members of the Assembly. And unfortunately, I don't have the benefit of the ruling uh, here today, but I will be happy to provide it uh, in the future, if order, if uh, if that's required, uh, but any time that a member makes the assertion that another member of the assembly is, and I quote from the benefit of the blues, MLA is openly advocating to break the law. It implies that they are uh, encouraging people to do something illegal. And that implication of another member uh, imputes false motives and, in fact, is out of order. The other thing that I would suggest is uh, no one inside this assembly uh, wants people to die and implying that uh, their actions are that is also out of order. And I know that Speaker Warner has also ruled on this matter uh, when the tables were reversed and members of the opposition made the implication that members of the government were killing members of a community or types of communities. And that too was ruled out of order because that was also not uh, factual and imputed false motives uh, to the member. 
And so in this case, I do find a point of order and the member can withdraw and apologize uh, and the official opposition house leader on his behalf. On behalf of the member, I apologize and withdraw. This matter dealt with and concluded at uh, 210. There was an additional point of order raised by the uh, opposition, or my apologies to the deputy government house leader in response to a, a question from the honorable member for Calgary North, uh, Calgary McCall. Sure, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and and uh, I, I raise this because uh, uh, if I heard it correctly. Um, the Honourable Member was making complaints about private members uh, and things that ha they had done. And of course, uh, question period is not for questioning private members, but rather questioning government members and government policy. As such, Mr. Speaker, I believe that you will find that out of order. Uh, I, I, I won't provide uh, the opportunity for a response because I did provide a caution around this particular matter. Um, immediately following this question in the second supplemental and I think it's important for members uh, to, re to recall or to make sure that uh, they are in fact um, referring to um, the government policy or matters uh, in the government's purview. I will just add that uh, because I believe the Honourable, the official opposition House Leader did raise an additional point of order uh, where at the end of that question, the Honourable the Premier stated, none of the subordinates this government responsibility to do the right thing based on the expert evidence and scientific evidence uh, to protect lives and livelihoods. Would these, uh, would they please stop lying about the fellow members of this place? As previously mentioned, uh, implying that a member is lying is out of order and so I'll call upon the Deputy Government House Leader to withdraw. No, no uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I understand that it doesn't matter how right something is somebody says. If they said something unparliamentary, it must be apologized for and withdrawn. And I, as such, will apologize for the word lying and withdrawn. The Honourable, uh, I thank you to the Deputy Government House Leader. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. Uh, point of order number four today uh, was called at 225 by the Honourable a uh, member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood and the uh, opposition house leader has risen to argue it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, under 23J uses abusive or insulting language of a nature likely to create disorder. And from our House of Commons procedure and practice, page 623 around unparliamentary language, uh, the minister uh, stated the reason the NDP is so pissed off, quote unquote, uh, which I submit is absolutely unparliamentary language and unnecessary for making his point. Uh, and with that, I, I raise this as a point of order. Sure, if he would like to apologize or have me ask him to apologize, the Honourable uh, Minister of Justice, Solicitor General. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, to be clear, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, if uh, it is um, the ruling of the Speaker that uh, that is a point of order, it would mean it would refer to the slang, you know, that word pissed off, according to an English dictionary, means very annoyed or angry. That is the defini English definition of the slang pissed off. So, it, 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 so no, I mean, seriously. Um, but if the speaker is prepared to rule that the use of the slang is unparliamentary, then I will do and apologize. I think, uh, I think we can agree that some cultural contexts around the use of the word pissed off uh, probably implies uh, unparliamentary language, and so I would ask you to apologize and withdraw. I would not apologize, Mr. Speaker. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded uh, at 2.32. The fifth and final point of order was raised by the Deputy Government House Leader uh, in response to a uh, question that was being asked by the Honourable the Member for Edmonton Goldbar, the Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking for my notes here. Uh, if I remember it correctly, and I apologize for, uh, is that again, I think it was another example of the uh, member opposite asking a question about the behavior of private members rather than the government, and, and of course that is uh, uh, not the uh, 
I, I, he's, I, I don't know whether I remember it correctly or not. I think I was busy and I didn't make proper notes. That's my best recollection. If it turns out to be wrong, then, then I'd be happy to withdraw the, uh, the uh, objection. Okay. I, uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate the withdrawal. You, you were answering uh, a question, and I too am not 100% sure. I, I might just add that there probably is a couple of things in this particular question um, uh, with respect to the use of the word bogus that, that may be similar to the word pissed. I'm not sure. Um, uh, or, or perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps making an accusation of uh, a member trying to make a few bucks personally. Yeah, this is easier, that's what it was. Well, it's, it's, it's okay. I, uh, and and um, uh, for the purposes of today, perhaps I will uh, provide a caution, but if we are implying that a minister of the Crown is utilizing their position to gain personally by making a few bucks, that is a quite likely... Uh, also unparliamentary as it imputes false motives of the minister. But for today, given the uncertainty of what we are actually speaking about, I won't rule a point of order, but call uh, a significant point of caution to the honorable member uh, of which he is familiar with. Standing order 42, during the routine, the honorable member for Edmonton, Glenora, provided oral notice of a SO42. I call upon her now to make a brief argument as to why this is urgent. And I do emphasize brief because we went through this just two days ago on what is and what isn't brief. So I encourage you to stick to the urgency or I will interject. Sorry, just for clarity, I'm very happy to stick to urgency. What, is there a definition of brief that the speaker would like me to comply with? Uh, Certainly, I said two days ago that wading into the content of the debate, providing masses amount of background on certain issues to try to prove your point that this is really bad. The, the point that you're trying to make is why should we set aside all of the other important business of the House to deal with your motion, not the content of the motion? Happy. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy to comply. Um, I rise pursuant to SO42 to request the ordinary business of the Legislative Assembly be adjourned to debate the motion with regards to a matter that is absolutely pressing and absolutely urgent, Mr. Speaker, and that is uh, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly affirm the need to uphold and enforce all current public health measures now and prevent the spread of COVID-19 so that the business, so that our businesses, our schools, our communities, and our economy as a whole can get back to normal and get back to work as soon as possible, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly I would say that this uh, meets the cause of urgency for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, yesterday we saw an uh, astronomical increase in the number of COVID cases in the province of Alberta, uh, over 1,300 new cases, the highest number we've seen so far in 2021. And I fear that today will be even worse, Mr. Speaker. And this Premier has previously stated that um, we expect to have over 1,000 people in hospital very soon, Mr. Speaker, and we know that that would cause uh, immense pressure on the healthcare system as well as on families and patients and, and healthcare workers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but perhaps the most pressing reason why I would say this is urgent is because these new orders come, uh, that the government announced just earlier this week come fully into force tomorrow. And yesterday, we saw at least 17 members of the government caucus uh, step up in opposition to those orders that are coming into a force tomorrow. So there have been many debates in this place as to whether those 17 members were intentionally undermining and encouraging people to uh, not follow the public health orders. And um, definitely folks in this caucus have one opinion about how that was interpreted. Uh, some folks in, in the government caucus probably have a different opinion. But this is a chance in this assembly, an urgent chance, before these rules come into effect tomorrow, to be crystal clear with the people of Alberta whether or not the 17 members of the United Conservative Caucus, formerly United Conservative Caucus, uh, are indeed in line with what the uh, pressing and urgent matter is that comes into effect tomorrow, if they are indeed encouraging people to disrespect and disregard those public health orders, or if they are not. This is absolutely urgent because it comes into effect tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, and we have an opportunity today to make the record straight whether or not this assembly uh, believes that the uh, orders that are being brought into force are actually should be followed or not. That's exactly what the motion is about. And it also is an opportunity for us before the numbers get even worse and more people end up in hospital 
and potentially die, Mr. Speaker, to make our intention clear. Honourable members, uh, Standing Order 42 requires unanimous consent of the Assembly and no other speakers are permitted to debate. I will ask only one question. Is there anyone opposed to providing unanimous consent? No. no. Unanimous consent is not granted. We are at orders of the day. Orders to jour. Government bills and orders for third reading Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. Honourable Mr. Dreeshen. The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it truly is an honour to rise today to move third reading of Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. Irrigation has historically been a game changer, Mr. Speaker, and now Madam Speaker, for Alberta's agriculture industry, transforming our land and entire communities, especially in southern Alberta. And it started way back in 1914 when uh, CP Rail engineers finished building an aqueduct, which was the largest structure of its kind in North America. And that construction of that aqueduct spearheaded the settlement of southern Alberta and a long successful history of irrigation in our province. And you can still see part of that structure standing today near Brooks, which is a testament to the ingenuity and determination of Alberta's early pioneers. And since that time, Madam Speaker, irrigation has continued to expand in the province, providing water for more than 1.7 million acres of farmland. And to put that into perspective, that's more than every other province in the country, Madam Speaker, as Alberta has 70 percent of the total irrigated acres within Canada. Now, Madam Speaker, irrigation is a vital contributor to our economy uh, and will be a critical part of Alberta's economic recovery. And it supports more than 56,000 jobs and contributes $3.6 billion annually to our province's GDP and also generates $2.4 billion in annual labour income for Albertans and families across the province. Now, to build the success in southern Alberta, just last year we announced a historic $815 million irrigation expansion project. Uh, which, if this bill is passed, we move one step closer to finalizing that deal, which will create over 8,000 jobs and over 200,000 new irrigated acres in the province. And the project uh, is also supposed to generate or will generate over $430 million every year to Alberta's GDP once all the projects are completed. And this will ultimately allow for greater water efficiency, allowing irrigation districts to do more within their existing water allocations. Now, the Alberta's government, we've provided a grant of over $244 million. The Canadian Infrastructure Bank provided a loan of more than $407 million. And eight irrigation districts combined have invested $163 million, Madam Speaker, into modernizing irrigation infrastructure in a first wave, a historic investment into irrigation. Uh, to increase our water storage capacity in the province. And breaking that down even further, Madam Speaker, that's $520 million to develop two new off-stream reservoirs and expand two existing ones, as well as $295 million for 56 modernization pipeline projects that will build hundreds of kilometres of new pipelines in southern Alberta. And we're also considering a number, number of additional shovel-ready projects in addition to this $850 million deal. And actually, Madam Speaker, just last week I went down to southern Alberta to uh, look at some of the, the work that's, being, uh, un that's underway with the St. Mary's Irrigation District. Uh, they've signed up for 26 projects and a new reservoir expansion. And, and while I was there visiting the active construction site, uh, where they're actually converting an open-air canal into uh, a pipeline. Now, Madam Speaker, we, we promised to get pipelines built in this province, and that's exactly what we're doing in southern Alberta. These pipes are, are 36 inches in diameter. That's uh, 113 inches around, Madam Speaker, and it'll stretch for hundreds of kilometres across the, the province. So, with all this irrigation expansion in southern Alberta, we won't just support farmers by improving yields or increasing their types of crops that can be grown. We'll also help attract new investments into the province, whether it be potato or sugar beet processing facilities. And we will actually diversify our agriculture sector, Madam Speaker, and drive Alberta's economic recovery. Now, this work with our value-added uh, investment attraction target of $1.4 billion in, uh, in new investments, as well as a 2,000 net new job, 
uh, target that we set uh, just last year. Of that already, Madam Speaker, we've actually attracted over $527 million in new agriculture value-add investment into Alberta, as well created nearly 1,000 jobs of that 2,000 net new job target. Now, these, all of these investments, the $527 million in new investments into the province, are everything from canola processing, plant processing or plant protein, grain processing, egg tech, emerging sectors like hemp, and also biocomposites, Madam Speaker. And Alberta's government obviously recognizes the importance of growing our agriculture sector, expanding primary agricultural production, and supporting a diversified value-added processing sector. So that is the why we've made it our mission to make Alberta the best place to invest. Uh, we are obviously cutting red tape by a third. We've implemented the job creation tax cut. And we're also modernizing how we can streamline and support businesses looking to invest here within the province. Now, Bill 54 builds upon the steps our government has taken to create an attractive environment for investment by clarifying that irrigation expansion and modernization investment is not a commercial activity. These amendments in Bill 54, Madam Speaker, will allow the industry to borrow funds for large-scale projects. So these amendments clarify what irrigation districts already knew to be true, which is that the enhancement of irrigation works and projects are acceptable and can proceed. The clarification also reinforces that understanding and it also sets our irrigation districts up for a future uh, with more expansion projects. So we are currently studying actually the feasibility of a number of additional projects where we could again expand irrigated acres and create new opportunities for Albertans. These amendments would provide assurance for irrigation districts and get shovels in the ground sooner for many projects. Uh, among other aspects, future projects will focus on increasing water storage efficiency, making it possible to do more within the same water allocation. Now, Madam Speaker, this is critical to the long-term success of our egg sector. Water, obviously, is a finite resource, which means we need to find ways to use it more efficiently. Now, the amendments would also ensure districts are able to pass bylaws, allowing them to stay modern and bring in new leadership and new ideas. This gives irrigation districts the option to develop term limits for their board. Now, each irrigation district can decide for themselves if they would like to implement a term limit. The ability to set term limits would also ensure irrigation districts are positioned to bring in new ideas and move forward with uh, any new modernization projects. So now, one thing I'm, I'm happy to see support for Bill 54 uh, from the members opposite, Madam Speaker. Irrigation, obviously, is a driving force in our economy, so it's great to see that support that we have within this chamber and for this very important piece of legislation. In saying that though, Madam Speaker, one thing that is still disappointing is that the members opposite do take this opportunity to actually attack other aspects of, of our government, which I, I wish they would focus on the importance of irrigation and Bill 54 itself. But uh, we're obviously here to discuss the importance of irrigation and how Bill 54 will bolster the province's irrigation districts and set them up for generations of growth. Now, we have a, obviously, as I mentioned, we have a strong history of irrigation in Alberta, and it should be something that all elected officials in this chamber and every Albertan across the province should be very proud to stand up and to, to talk about and to promote. I hope that throughout third reading, the members opposite can stick to speaking about Bill 54 and just how important it is to Alberta's farmers and irrigation districts, especially in southern Alberta, but also across the entire province, Madam Speaker. And with that, I am pleased to move third reading of Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. Thank you. Honourable members, are there any members wishing to join debate on third reading of Bill 54? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Goldbar. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and offer a few comments uh, on, on Bill 54. And I, I will say straight up that I will uh, disappoint the Minister of Agriculture uh, and, and not stick to the points uh, that he's urged us to. And I can understand why. The Minister is eager for us to stick to uh, strictly what's in the legislation here before us because he doesn't want us talking about the complete uh, incompetence that his government has shown on a number of files that uh, relate to agriculture that my friends and I have highlighted during debate on this bill. Uh, and so, you know, if, if the minister is so sensitive about his government's incompetence, then I would urge him to go back to the cabinet table and get him to reverse a bunch of the decisions that they've made that will also negatively, that will negatively impact agricultural producers. Uh, one of the um, 
I, I, I wanted to start my comments by uh, uh, talking about um, some, of the, some of the threats by delineating some of the threats to the agricultural sector that have already been raised by uh, my friends here in the official opposition. Uh, last night, uh, my friend from Lethbridge West talked at length about the cuts that the agriculture the department has made uh, with respect to the resources that have been invested in, 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 in research. Uh, so uh, I, I think she, she mentioned a figure of approximately 250 researchers were laid off. Uh, and, and, and she went at l length about the negative impact that that will have on future innovation uh, and, uh, and future research that uh, could potentially benefit uh, the mm -hmm. agricultural sector going forward. And, uh, and I certainly think that that poses a, a grave risk. What also poses a grave risk, as I mentioned in response to my friend from Lethbridge West's comments about the cuts to uh, agriculture department research, is the cuts that the advanced education minister is making to universities that are also I engaged in important agricultural research. Uh, as I said last night, during Committee of the Whole, uh, the Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Alberta is one of the best faculties of agriculture in, in the entire world. And it's been doing fantastic research supporting the agricultural sector here in our province for over a hundred years. And uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, well it's more than unfortunate, it's devastating to the people of Alberta that hundreds of millions of dollars have been cut from the budget of the University of Alberta and some of that will have an impact on the excellent work that is being done uh, to support agricultural research. I also highlighted at that time, and, and I want to reiterate this concern again today in, in third reading, that one of the key pieces uh, that underpins the successful research that's going on at uh, the uh, Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Alberta is their ability to use land that's called the West 240 for uh, research purposes. Now, this land is in the heart of Edmonton. And, uh, and, and if developed, would be prime real estate for uh, 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 residential or commercial purposes. And certainly that's one of the intents that the uh, um, proposed land trust that the University of Alberta has been pushing for a number of years, uh, that's, one of the thing, that's one of the goals, is to convert the West 240 from an agricultural research site uh, to a residential development. And uh, when I was Minister of Advanced Education, I resisted those calls by the University of Alberta to do that because uh, my friends at the Faculty of Agriculture at the University explained to me the significant loss that paving over the West 240 would have for the future of agriculture. Because the University of Alberta spins this story that, that they have this fantastic research, and, and you know, the facility uh, north of St. Albert is a fantastic facility, there's no doubt about it but it, can, it cannot replace the research that's being done at the West 240 uh, on, on, the, on the university farm in the heart of Edmonton. So uh, I, I, I will reiterate my call to the government to resist the lobbying that's being done by the University of Alberta and their friends who want to create a land trust and to convert the West 240 at the Alberta, University of Alberta farm uh, into a residential development because it would set back research uh, in the agricultural field um, uh, uh, back a, a generation or more. Now in my comments at Committee of the Whole uh, last night, uh, I, I highlighted some of the environmental policies that are being undertaken by the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Environment that are also threatening uh, ir the, the irrigation system and the agricultural producers who are supported by that. Uh, and he, two of the significant policies are, of course, the, the Minister of Environment's insistence on monkeying with the Old Man River Basin Allocation Order. Uh, and, of course, he continues to imply that it's uh, only to save the fish. Uh, 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 but, of course, nobody believes that that's the actual reason that he's intent on monkeying with the allocation order. Everybody suspects that he's doing so in support of potential coal mine development in the Old Man River Basin. That goes along with the Minister of Energy's plan to uh, open up vast swaths of the eastern slopes 
uh, to uh, uh, potential coal mining. And I see that the Canadian cattlemen just uh, put out a statement today urging the government to reconsider its uh, plans to open up vast swaths of the eastern slopes to coal mining. And, and so I, I sincerely hope that if the Minister of Agriculture is intent on uh, following through on his commitment to agricultural producers, that he will urge his colleagues, the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Energy, to reverse these policies that will have a significant negative impact on irrigation districts and the agricultural producers that are supported by them. Because it, 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 even from a, 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 just a, a fiscally transparent point, or a, a fiscal prudence standpoint, it doesn't make sense to invest $815 million into expanding a system that will only be able to distribute uh, small, sh ever shrinking quantities of ever more contaminated water, Madam Speaker. That doesn't make any sense to build out uh, the irrigation district's uh, systems and then turn around and make sure that none of the water, that, it, uh, that, that there's no suitable water available to the irrigation districts for them to use. That doesn't make any sense. Now, coal mining and water allocations are not the only environmental threats that, face, that are faced by the irrigation districts. Uh, and today I want to talk about what I think is probably the most pressing and serious threat to irrigation districts and, their, and the agricultural supporters or producers that, that they support, and that's climate change. We know that if the world doesn't take action to reduce the impacts of climate change in the future, that the areas that are served by the irrigation districts will continue to dry out. And Madam Speaker, at, at, at this point, on, on talking about climate change, I do have to highlight my grave concerns about items in the draft curriculum that talk about climate change being the result of many factors. It, it is incredibly distressing to me to see that this government is intent on educating future generations of Albertans into thinking that sunspots and variations in the Earth's orbit are what are driving climate change at the moment. Yes, those things have driven climate change in the ancient history of, of the Earth, but that's not the overriding cause of climate change right now. The overriding cause of climate change is man-made emissions of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases that are trapping the heat that is generated, uh, that, 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 that emanates from the earth. And it's this failure to even understand the basic underlying causes of climate change that I believe uh, drives this government to not take the issue of climate change seriously. I think, uh, I, I, I can't remember who was making a statement earlier today uh, during the, the daily routine. They were touting the uh, government's uh, reduction of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions by, I, I think it was 38 megatons, saying, oh, what a, what a, what a great job they're doing. They're, they're allegedly reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 38 megatons, Madam Speaker. Well, there are only two problems with that. First of all, uh, our, our plan, when it was in place, was going to reduce it by 20 megatons more than that, Madam Speaker. We have a, a lot of work to do to make sure that Alberta uh, uh, helps Canada meet its climate change commitments. And our government was on track to do that work, and this government has derailed all of that work. And it's the agricultural producers that the Minister of Agriculture purports to be defending who are going to suffer the most from the effects of climate change. The projections, uh, 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 David Sochin, uh, and forgive me if I uh, am not pronouncing his name correctly, I've only seen it in print, I've never heard it pronounced, uh, is a professor at the University of Regina who has been doing work for years uh, modeling the potential impacts of climate change on the prairie provinces. And the outlook is not good. 
we will continue to uh, experience hotter, drier conditions for much longer periods of time if we don't take action on climate change. And so that's why it's important when we decide to support this bill that we couple our support with this bill or our support for this bill with other actions that will support agricultural producers. So I'm happy to vote in favor of this legislation today because I believe that building out the irrigation district's infrastructure with this $815 million will set up the agricultural sector for future success. But that future success is only guaranteed if we combine it with sensible environmental policies such as prohibiting coal mining in the eastern slopes, making sure that the existing allocations for our irrigation districts remain unchanged, and taking meaningful action to combat climate change. So I sincerely hope that the Minister of Agriculture takes, takes these warnings back to his colleagues on Executive Council and that we see additional action from this government on these important pieces of policy uh, uh, so that we can set up our agricultural producers for success. Uh, Madam Speaker, can I have a time check? Uh, you have seven and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's one other uh, issue that I want to <clears throat> raise with respect to protecting our irrigation infrastructure. And this came to me um, uh, from a constituent who has a, a vacation property at a place called Payne Lake, which I understand is in the, is in the Cardston area. And she is concerned uh, uh, about a number of things that are happening around Payne Lake. And, and it's my understanding that Payne Lake is a major source of water for one of the irrigation districts in southern Alberta. But that, that lake is under threat from a couple of, thing, uh, a couple of disturbing developments. One is uh, increased residential development around the lake. And we know that residential development around lakes needs to be conducted uh, 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 with sensible regulations to make sure that, that those developments don't negatively impact water quality and water quantity. And this, uh, this person wrote to me, and, and she's not convinced uh, that the residential uh, development is proceeding in such a fashion. And so if anybody uh, from the government caucus who has anything to do about it is hearing what I'm saying, I sincerely hope that they uh, go back and, and look at what can be done at the provincial level to make sure that residential development around Payne Lake and any other uh, lakes that feed our irrigation districts are, are, are done in a way that doesn't threaten uh, the water quality and water quantity that our irrigation districts uh, rely upon. The other uh, concern that she raised with me when I talked to her a couple of weeks ago was the use of recreational watercraft on the lake uh, that hasn't been necessarily inspected for invasive zebra mussels. Now, currently the, uh, the province of Alberta monitors, uh, or allegedly monitors, uh, watercraft that are coming into the province from out of province. Uh, it, this person maintains that in order to effectively protect our irrigation district water sources, that these watercraft should be inspected when they are, before they are put into the lake. And uh, she certainly highlighted to me her concerns with um, the cost of mitigating uh, zebra mussels once they are in the irrigation district system uh, are, are astronomical the, compared to the cost of proper inspections and prevention measures. And so I sincerely hope that uh, any members of Executive Council or the Government Caucus who have the ability to influence uh, the procedures that the government follows when uh, uh, inspecting recreational watercraft for zebra mussels uh, can take some pr uh, protective action to make sure that Payne Lake and uh, these other irrigation district water sources don't become contaminated with zebra mussels uh, because that damage would also be uh, 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 very expensive to undo. So, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, 
uh, I'll sum up my points by saying that I'm, uh, uh, I'm sure that all of my friends here in the official opposition will join me in supporting this bill at third reading. We believe strongly in, in making this investment necessary uh, through this legislation uh, and that by making this investment, we will set up our agricultural sector for future success. But it, it can't be understated that much more needs to be done to protect the water that uh, our irrigation districts rely on. And I sincerely hope that all members of the uh, Executive Council and private members in the Government Caucus uh, take, do the right thing and do everything that they can to protect the water sources that are so critical to the success of our irrigation districts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any other members wishing to join debate on Bill 54 in third reading? Seeing none, would the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Forestry like to close the debate? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I would like to uh, close debate on Bill 54. Thank you. Well, members, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Forestry has moved third reading of Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. Those in favour of the motion for third reading, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. So carried. Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021 is now read a third time. Under Government Bills and Orders for Third Reading, Bill 211, Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020, Ms. Glasgow. The Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Hat. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I believe I'm moving third reading, correct? Yeah, I rise to move third reading of Bill 211, the Firearms Amendment, Amendment Act, Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act. Um, it's an honour to rise today. Um, Albertans firearms des owners deserve clarity on how they acquire, store, and use their personal property. Um, we know that the current legislation being um, considered by the federal Liberals only make that, makes that information murky for honest, um, law-abiding citizens across the country. Um, the federal Bill C-21 also attempts to place an unnecessary burden on the 352 municipalities in our province. In addition to being constitutionally questionable at best, their poorly conceived idea is a direct challenge to the ideals that founded our nation. That our nation was a confederation of provinces and territories with equal but separate division of legislative powers from the federal government. We know that Bill C-21 is an overreach into provincial jurisdiction and we committed to Albertans that we would stand up for Alberta. One of the response, uh, one of the responsibilities clearly defined in the Canada's Constitution is the province's creation and the oversight of municipalities. Bill 211 will set that right. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know and I know that Albertans are smart enough to know that made in Toronto calls for big city gun bans are futile since the gang members flagrantly using those uh, firearms will not follow such a bylaw. Criminals break laws. That's what they do inherently. And uh, one more bylaw is not going to get in their way. The amendments to this bill retain the intent of the proposed legislation to restrict the ability of municipalities to pass firearms, but also provide a balance to ensure that Cabinet approves new bylaws and changes, but they also retain the, minister, um, the Minister's ability to be responsible for the Wildlife Act, in this case the Minister of Environment and Parks, to continue to manage hunting in Alberta. Um, it will avoid potential confusion and disruption regarding existing municipal bylaws passed under the current legislation. Um, opponents to this bill say municipal handgun bans are an effort to fight crime. That's patently false. In reality, they only risk, uh, increase the risk of ordinarily law-abiding people becoming inadvertent criminals. And firearms owners already jump through enough hoops to follow the rules. They don't need more needless red tape, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill, as we all know and we've spoken about before, has been modeled after Saskatchewan's Bill 194. Um, and it strikes the right balance between ensuring safety and uh, common sense. Bill 211 also aligns with the conservative values of individual liberty is always preferable to big government intervention, something that I fully support. Alberta firearms owners are the le least likely to commit a crime and maintained freedom is their reward for their responsible lifestyle. One in seven Canadians being licensed firearms owners, I don't believe that we, uh, we have a large problem here to fix. As far as um, illegal, uh, as far as legal firearms owners being the problem, Mr. Speaker, 
Um, I believe our government will continue to do the work of making our communities safer and putting com criminals where they belong, which is behind bars. While intimate partner violence is abhorrent, um, the reality is that firearms owners are among the least likely to be involved in those crimes. Less than 1%, actually 0.7, of all domestic violence calls even have a firearm present at their address, let alone used or threatened, according to Statistics Canada. Suicide prevention is also a cited reason by uh, some of the members opposite and some of the emails that I've gotten to um, oppose uh, this bill, but mental health treatment is an area that our government and myself take very seriously. And um, the reality is that firearms are not used as often as other, and other methods, which does not, which is, of course does not um, minimize the fact that they have been used. But um, in fact, according to a peer review study, the gun legislation in Canada has done little to affect suicide or homicide rates in Canada. But increasing support for mental health um, community initiatives continues to be the number one asset in suicide prevention. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, I have um, tirelessly lobbied for um, members of my own community and groups such as the Interman Project and our collective journey to be funded by our government to ensure that they can continue to provide um, essential peer-to-peer -peer support services, which um, they were very lucky to receive funding um, to the tune of $150,000, and I believe there's actually, there might even be more exciting news to come on that. Um, but Albertans can be confident that our government will continue to support law-abiding Albertans and respect their rights to safely use and acquire pup, uh, pup, their own private property. Um, I hope, Mr. Speaker, that all my colleagues on both sides of the House will join me in supporting Bill 211, the Municipal Governments Act. Thank you. Any other members wishing to speak to Bill 211 in third reading? Seeing none, would the member from Brooks Medicine Hat like to rise and close debate? Waved. Right. The Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Hat has moved third reading of Bill 211, Municipal Government's Firearms Amendment Act 2020. Those in favour of the motion for third reading, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. I believe the ayes have it, and the division has been called. Ring the bells.
Honourable members, a division has been called on third reading of Bill 211. Would all those members in favour please rise? Honourable Mr. Luan, Honourable Minister Lagrange, Honourable Mr. Glubish, Honourable Mr. Hunter, Honourable Mr. Wilson, Honourable Ms. Pawn, Mr. Turton, Mr. Yao, Ms. Goodridge, Mrs. Pitt, Mr. Guthrie, the Honourable Mr. Schweitzer, Mr. Walker, Mr. Orr, Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Rosewell, Ms. Glasgow, Mr. Stephan, Mr. Rain, Mr. Singh. Would all members opposed please rise? Mr. Dang, Ms. Renault, Member Irwin, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Nielsen, Ms. Pantoli. Total, uh, Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 20, total against 6. That motion is carried. Bill 11, Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020 is now read a third time. Under government bills and orders for second reading, Bill 56, Local Measures Statutes Amendment Act 2021, adjourn debate, Honorable Mr. Madhu. Are there any members wishing to join debate on the referral motion? The, oh, sorry, the Honourable Member from Edmonton Decor. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, appreciate yet another opportunity to rise here this afternoon to add some additional comments uh, on Bill 56, uh, the Local Measures Statutes Amend Amendment Act 2021. Um, you know, I guess uh, for some, maybe some of the folks that didn't get an opportunity to um, uh, watch the debate uh, from last night. Um, you know, some of it ranged around uh, facts. Um, I, I know the, the Minister of Justice was very um, uh, concerned with, uh, with facts ar around this bill. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, we didn't take ad advantage of the opportunity last night uh, to potentially send this uh, to committee uh, to hear from, from Albertans, uh, you know, we know this UCB government wants to uh, involve Albertans and the legislation uh, that uh, that government uh, member, governs them. I hesitate to interrupt, but you are already on the record speaking for the ref oh my gosh, the referral motion. Uh, we voted on the referral last night. Yeah, the referral was voted on last night. We were all here. Remember, we, uh, if you could just confirm, if you were saying that you have not spoken on the main bill, just ask you to confirm that. Uh, we'll reset your time uh, to its beginning and you can proceed from there. I haven't spoken to the main. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Appreciate that. And, and my apologies if I may have uh, uh, caused some confusion by referring to that from last night. So, um, yeah, it was just uh, mostly just a recap for maybe folks that were joining us uh, today uh, to watch this, uh, this debate uh, part. Uh, and, and so we, we didn't take advantage of that, and uh, which is which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard this government uh, wanting Albertans to be participatory um, with legislation, uh, promoting referendums, things like that, uh, yet won't send it uh, to a committee to uh, hear from them. 
uh, which, which is unfortunate. But that happens to be one of the facts right now. Uh, I think some of the other facts that um, weren't included uh, in, in last night's uh, debate that I think we should include here now on Bill 56 um, is the fact that if Albertans are supposed to buy into Bill 56 and the effects it has on them, then the government needs to understand what's already happened and why members of the opposition are standing up in opposition to this. So fact is the UCP government gave a great big corporate tax break to large profitable corporations, yet we're seeing some of them not paying their property taxes. Yet we have seen, fact, changes that are creating higher property taxes for Albertans. Yet contained in Bill 56, we have changes that will increase more costs for Albertans yet again. The fact is, the government created a war room at a significant cost to Albertans. What are we getting for our money? Well, we're fighting with a cartoon character. Yet in Bill 56, we're asking Albertans to take on more costs. And their utility bills are higher because of changes this government brought in. That is yet another fact. We have facts that insurance premiums have been going up due to changes that this government brought forward removing the cap. Yet in Bill 56, we're asking Albertans to absorb even more. The fact is, there have been changes where higher fees will be coming in, like parking. Yet, we're asking Albertans to take on yet even more through Bill 56. Higher child care expenses, the changes that we have seen the government bring forward, ending the $25 a day child care, has increased the costs for them to get quality childcare. But yet in Bill 56, we're asking for Albertans to take on yet even more because you're putting municipalities in a position where they're going to have to download these costs. So when you have higher utilities, higher income taxes, because of course you, you know, de-indexed uh, that, higher insurance premiums, higher tuition. I forgot to mention tuition for students. Their tuition is going to be higher. Their loan repayments are going to be higher because of increased uh, uh, interest rates on their loans. The fees, like I mentioned, around parking, property taxes, child care. And then you wonder why I have a problem with the money that you're going to download onto them, just for example, with the changes contained in Bill 56 around 911 and, and the infrastructure and whatnot. And so it's incumbent upon the opposition to bring these concerns forward because we've been hearing it over and over again. I've certainly heard it from my constituents. I know my colleagues have heard it from theirs. And I know the opposition has heard it from your constituents as well. So it's too bad that we didn't take advantage, get a chance to hear from Albertans. And we're pressing ahead with a bill that's going to negatively impact them. It'd be interesting to know what kind of consultation took place with municipalities around this. I think it would probably be easier if we had just sent it to committee. We could, could have heard from them. Perhaps then maybe they could have come in and said, yeah, absolutely, this is what we said we wanted. This is exactly what uh, they uh, uh, gave us. We're happy with this. It would have shut us up, quite honestly. 
I don't think that happened. Based on just what I've seen this government do in the past around its supposed consultation. The most, one of the most recent, of course, is, is the coal policy. Clearly no consultation done around that. You know, I heard earlier this afternoon, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, touting this big mandate that they were given in 2019. And obviously enough pushback caused the government to back off on the coal policy for the moment, but yet not really back off on it. And so why should I, I guess, take your word for it, that proper consultation with the municipalities in Alberta around 911. I think I've asked this before in the past. Where, where was that in the UCP platform? I always like to go back to that, but the biggest platform ever in, in history and all the hundreds of pages. Where was changes to 911? Forcing $41 million in 911 upgrades on the municipalities and ultimately Albertans. Because they're going to have to get that from somewhere. They're going to get it from their residents because you've cut back on so many other things that municipalities need. So it all goes to pattern, Madam Speaker. I've heard time and time again, I've pointed it out time and time again in this House. The things that are said, the legislation that comes forward, and they're not matching up. I can't support this bill as it's in its current form. And I don't think Albertans can support it either. And, and trying to go down that road or the, the excuse, well, it's only a small little cost, it's only a small little cost. But when you've been nickel and diming them for the past two years, And the fact is, the big corporate tax break didn't create jobs for them. It, it didn't grow the economy. So why do we think that this is going to help Albertans? You're putting them in yet another harder position where they're going to have to start making decisions about what they're paying. Well, do I pay my higher insurance bill today? Or do I buy my groceries or do I pay my property taxes or do I pay my utility bill because they've all gone up maybe going back to maybe some of the comments that I started earlier maybe we should have some of these big corporations that got that big corporate tax break pay their property taxes I'm, I'm curious madam speaker what would happen if Albertans all of a sudden decided not to pay their property taxes. They could just simply say, hey, it's tough times, you know, I just, I don't have the money, I have to pay my car insurance because that went up, because the cap was removed. I have to pay my childcare fees because $25 a day childcare was taken away and now I'm looking at double the amount I was. So, if indeed we want to look at the facts, then you have to start taking all the facts into consideration when we're looking at Bill 56. You know, it, it was an interesting discussion last night, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, talking about debt and, and, and deficit. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the conversation I had around the words may, will, and shall. You know, I was hearing, it seemed like, oh, debt and deficit is the, the same thing. Not quite, no. And may, will, and shall aren't the same things either. Tried to sell the fact that, well, the former NDP government ran us all this, all this debt. Your first budget was $6 billion higher, the deficit. 
than what the former NDP government projected. Fact. I hate to say it. And we have seen decisions that have backfired greatly for the people of Alberta. So it's incumbent upon the official opposition to look at Bill 56 and say, whoa, 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 you're headed in the wrong direction here. You can make different choices here. Perhaps there's still an opportunity to, to, to fix this. But until we start hearing a little bit about how our constituents are going to be able to handle these higher costs, maybe we shouldn't be asking them to take on yet even more. And if you don't think that those things are going to get downloaded on, onto them, I think you're kidding yourself. Because municipalities are not going to be able to make up $41 million on the 911 upgrade. There's been too many other cuts that have been downloaded to them. And there's, there's no other levers. They either collect more property taxes or they start bringing in all kinds of user fees. Bottom line is, falls to Albertans to make that up. So we need to reconsider Bill 56 in its current form. We have to do a little bit better. I do look forward to the rest of the debate. Perhaps members will, will stand up, offer some suggestions of what we could do different, offer some suggestions about where else we could go. Maybe someone might want to reconsider reaching out to Albertans and Alberta businesses as well, because this is going to affect them as well. If you're going to promote participation from Albertans on the legislation that's brought to this house, then offer them participation. Not just pick and choose, called cherry picking, on what you actually want to hear from them on. So I hope, uh, Madam Speaker, that, uh, that, that we do take a different direction. I'm not in support of Bill uh, 56 in its current form. Uh, I do want to see some changes. Let's get, get to Alberta, uh, Albertans and their businesses and see what kind of things we can do better than what we've currently got here. Honourable Member Standing Order 29-2A is available. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Highlands and Norwood. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to my uh, colleague from uh, Edmonton Decor for his thoughtful comments. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, I had the uh, honor of being able to speak to this bill last night. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that I talked about and a few of my colleagues as well is really contextualize Bill 56 uh, as to how it will impact our communities. And I think this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why we're so concerned about this bill because it's, a, it's another attack on municipalities. And as I stressed, Municipalities aren't just these, um, these abstract objects. Municipalities are made up of people. They're communities. And you can point to so many actions of this UCP government that continue to attack communities. Whether it's the cuts to CFEP grants that impact directly community leagues and community associations across this province. Whether it's the... Uh, ongoing uh, it costs to families in these communities, whether it's uh, raising provincial park fees or property taxes, the list goes on. I talked about the impact on folks who are the most vulnerable, right? We've seen a continued pattern of this government uh, attacking those communities, starting with one of the earliest moves in uh, de-indexing H. And so I was really uh, intrigued by some of the comments the, the member made yesterday um, in regards to his own community and how Bill 56 will impact it. And one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about was something that he mentioned was just the impacts on community infrastructure. And he talked about some of the changes that are happening to uh, busing, 
to to uh, to bus services in his community. His riding, if you don't know Edmonton Decor, is just north of mine, north of the Yellowhead. Uh, you know, I don't I don't go I don't venture uh, venture up that way too much anymore because I like to you know stay within the boundaries of Edmonton Highlands Norwood, other than when coming to work, of course. Um, but I know I spent a lot of time up there uh, in in my previous. Um, work politically and uh, I know just how important that uh, infrastructure is and I've heard from my own constituents I've he heard from some seniors in my community who are quite concerned about the loss of bus routes now we're not here to blame the city because the city is having to make these very tough decisions due to cuts from the province the city is being put in an ex incredibly difficult position in that uh, they're having to, to, to make decisions that they should never have to make. And we know it was the Minister of uh, uh, Municipal Affairs who basically said to the media that, sorry, cities are going to have to make, uh, you know, municipalities are going to have to make some tough, tough choices. They're already having to make tough choices. And on top of that, in the midst of a pandemic, you're going to make a further 25% cut to their funding? Seems like an incredibly unfair position to put uh, to, to put our municipalities in. So, uh, with whatever time's remaining, which I'm sure there's not a great deal, I'd ask the member from Edmonton to Gore, just if you could, just talk a little bit more about some of those impacts on your local communities in Edmonton to Cork. Well, members, I'm just going to take this opportunity to remind all members to uh, direct comments through the chair, the honourable member from Edmonton to Cork. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and, and I would certainly invite the member from uh, Edmonton Highlands, uh, uh, Norwood, to come on up to Decor. We've got some amazing businesses there, restaurants. Uh, it's an awesome place. So hopefully, when we get a chance to get back to those things, um, we can uh, we can enjoy some some time there. But uh, as she was mentioning around the infrastructure, um, you know, Edmonton has been placed in a very tough position. Um, you know, Edmonton has made a commitment uh, around affordable housing. Uh, trying to end uh, homelessness uh, within the city. So while they're struggling with how to deliver uh, those services, they're now having to struggle to decide, well, do we provide bus service uh, for, for uh, our residents? And, and I know with, uh, with some of the areas in, in uh, uh, Edmonton Decor, uh, some folks don't have the same means as others. And so they do rely on the bus service to get around, to get to work, to get to their appointments and things like that. And one of the choices that it, it seems Edmonton is, is being forced to make is, is bus service going straight through the middle of Edmonton Decor on 82nd Street, which is a major uh, roadway through the riding. I, I've got 60... Any other members wishing to join debate on Bill 56 and second reading? The Honourable Member for St. Albert. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my pleasure to um, rise and speak to Bill 56, a Local Measures Statutes Amendment Act. And, um, you know, I'm going to add some of the comments um, that I mentioned last night when we were speaking, or I was speaking to the referral amendment, now we're on the main bill. And so I, I did um, outline the three, the three things essentially that this bill does. And I'd like to outline them again before I get into um, some of my thoughts on this piece of legislation. So the first thing it does is that it extends the municipal sustainability initiative uh, and delays the implementation of the replacement program, the local government fiscal framework. And as I mentioned last night, Madam Chair, uh, this is a problem. This is a problem um, for, for a number of reasons. And it is a, it's a problem for uh, large municipalities that were looking for legislative predictability. Well, not only that, they're looking for transparency and of course funding to match uh, the needs that they express, but they are looking for that legislative predictability. The second thing that this piece of legislation does is it cuts uh, the MSI program. So the, the government members and the minister actually has argued that although uh, there is a cut and there is some front-loading of cash that, that eases that burden, therefore that cut shouldn't be problematic. Well, you know, that in itself is problematic on, on multiple levels. I mean, certainly it is, um, it is good that there, there's some front-loading, so there's some extra funding available right now this year for municipalities. Uh, we know that uh, we need to get people back to work. Well, actually, we knew that before COVID as well. 
but we know that we need to get people back to work. Uh, and we know that this is uh, one of the ways to do that is to ensure municipalities have the funds that they need to invest in infrastructure and all of the work that those communities do. So while that is great to front load, to, to put some money, to invest some money in um, municipalities and communities, the problem is, is that after the one year, it just tanks. So I'm going to give you an example uh, from St. Albert because that is the, the community that I represent. And so the front loading, so let's look at MSI for the three years. Uh, in the first year, um, the front loading results in $18 million. Now for a community the size of St. Albert that is uh, approaching about 70, close to 70,000 people, um, that, that's good, actually. It allows them to do a number of projects. If anyone's interested, you can go on the City of St. Albert website and look clearly at their capital projects that, they, that they've identified are high priority for themselves. And so this allows them to do some work. And you know, to, to, to elaborate on what I said yesterday, or last night, was that the City of St. Albert has worked very, very hard over the last, I don't know how many years, um, to expand their tax base, if you will. So the vast majority of revenue from previously from St. Albert came from residential taxes. That was just the reality. You know, it's been called a bedroom community, all of those things. It is far more than that. Mm -hmm. But I think the real problem was that they were heavily reliant on other communities for services. And so over the years, St. Albert has done a fantastic job just expanding and developing all of the services and attracting some world-class companies, some amazing investment, but that's all taken effort and that's taken investment. You know, a good example of um, the previous minister of, uh, was it transportation at the time, Brian Mason, was actually involved in uh, securing a contract with the city of St. Albert and the government of Alberta to twin uh, Ray Gibbon Drive. So for any of you that know that area, it was actually quite dangerous but it really prohibited flow in that corridor, and that corridor was essential to um, invest and actually grow the ability of that community to be able to grow their tax base, their corporate tax base. And so what that did is that opened up all kinds of, of opportunity, but then that requires additional um, infrastructure investment, not just road maintenance, but you know all of the other things associated. So when I look at this MSI, sure, it's front-loaded, $18 million year one, that's okay, that'll allow them to meet some of the goals they have identified. The very next year, it drops down to $4.6 million. And it goes even lower than that after that. So, I mean, this is a significant drop. And once again, and I said this last night, Madam Chair, I'm sure you'll remember, it was riveting, that um, we talk about, it's like this budget, this UCP budget is like this massive shell game. So yeah, here's the money over here, but you know, we're gonna take it and move it around, and you never really know where it's coming from. And then you have these fantastical announcements. This is a historic investment in policing. This is a historic investment in municipalities, when in reality, it's just shuffling things around and moving them around and then spinning. And that's what it is. So while I'm appreciative that it's front-loaded, I recognize the situation that we're in, global health emergency, we've got an economy that is beyond struggling, so I understand this. What I am disappointed is that this piece of legislation actually creates more burden for municipalities. So I know just uh, the leadership in the city of St. Albert, obviously they were expecting a cut of some kind. Um, I think they were a little bit stunned at the size of the reduction. So spin it however you like, make yourself feel good that it's front loaded. The reality is it's a cut. And when that happens, Madam Speaker, I know I talked about this last night, when that happens, I mean, municipalities have um, things they need to get done. From the basics, road maintenance, repair, enforcement, safety, and then all of those other things that contribute to the quality of life of the community all of those things get looked at and they get reduced in many cases because there, there is not the funding to be able to sustain it. So that is the second thing that this piece of legislation does. The third thing is in order to fund updates to the 911 system, we know is federally mandated, understand that, they're increasing, the, this government is in, wants to increase through this legislation, monthly cell phone bill tax by 51 cents, going from 44 to 95. As I said last night again, for most people, you know, this is, this is probably something you can manage. 
we can all in this place, I'm, I'm sure that we can manage that. But there are far too many people that cannot. For example, we know that this government, the UCP, has cut benefits to some of the poorest people in the province. And those are people that live on income support. There's about 60,000 of them. Yeah. Those are people that live on age. Those are, there's about 70,000 of them. These people live so far below the poverty line, it's ridiculous. And yet, you know, we still hear the government, well, it's the best benefits in the country, which is patently not true, but anyway. So what I'm saying is that, yes, it's just one more expense that is being passed on to Albertans, many of which just can't afford it. And when you look at everything in its totality, for even for a resident of St. Albert, they likely will be paying more in property taxes. They likely are paying more in insurance, for insurance. They're going to pay more for this particular tax. And it goes on and on and on. And the cost of living continues to go up. But yet this government will say, you know, oh, we're doing all of these great things. But what they're doing is downloading expenses to individual Albertans, to, to municipalities. And there's an inherent danger in that. And so those are the main three things that this particular bill does. And so, um, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about, and it isn't, and I, I mentioned this last night, it isn't just this one thing that is downloaded to uh, municipalities that are going to make or break municipalities. It, is, it isn't just this one thing. It isn't just MSI. Because as we know, likely leadership in, in those municipalities will find a way to make things work. They always do, right? This is what they have to do. But this is coupled with other enormous changes that are causing enormous pressure in communities right across Alberta. So one of the things um, that we've been focused on this week, partially because uh, during a public accounts meeting, we were able to ask questions to uh, Justice and Solicitor General around policing. I think so. We are all very, very clear that the way that policing is uh, paid for has changed significantly in Alberta. Now, there's a couple of ways that happen for uh, communities that are under 5,000 people. They will now have, have to pay where they did not before. That is causing all kinds of concerns and problems. Uh, this goes back to 2019 when we were hearing from communities all over the place saying, this isn't sustainable. We can't do this. And then I think the shock wore off a little bit. And then they started saying, well, how are you going to improve service? How, where's the benchmark? How are we going to know things are going to get better? How are we going to know that rural crime will be addressed by this enormous shift in funding? Silence. We even asked that in public accounts. And although I think officials did uh, submit that they would um, share some numbers about sort of boots on the ground as a result of these funding changes, We've not heard from this government about what that plan is. So we hear a lot about rural crime tour all the time. We did this great rural crime tour. We're doing this, we're doing that. That's great. But we need to see details. What does that mean for these communities that are facing enormous financial pressures? So there is that. The other piece of the larger community, so for example, St. Albert. Now when you add this downloaded cost increase to what is being proposed in Bill 56, it is a problem. So a city like St. Albert, the size of St. Albert, they are projecting a loss of revenue. Um, actually, in 2020, it was over $600,000, and that's a loss from their portion of voter radar. So we know that the government has chosen to take a larger share of the revenue that is collected by the RCMP and um, contributing to the over, overall net expense of policing municipal enforcement. So instead of taking 25% as they did before, they are now taking 40%. So this is one more pressure on municipalities that are stretched and feeling the pressure. We know this. We know this. We know that they're stressed. We know that there's pressure. But still, this government says, no, we got your back. We're supporting all of these communities. Yet they fail to see it has been two years of downloading cost and downloading pressures. All the while, you know, they'll throw their hands up and say, well, we don't have any choice, right? We have to do this. We don't have any money. We're broke. What are we going to do? But then Albertans sort of scratch their heads and go, okay, well, that's really strange because we've got this war room budgeted $120 million over four years. Where'd that come from? But what about $1.3 billion for KXL, essentially betting on Trump's reelection? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. People aren't buying it. 
So I have a number of concerns about this piece of legislation. And, you know, we asked some questions last night, and I don't think anyone stood up to answer, and that's not unusual um, in this place. Oh, yeah, we did have one person stand up. But, you know, one of the questions, I know uh, one of my colleagues raised this, and I would just like to um, raise it again, because I think it's important, Madam Speaker, because I, all of us keep talking about, you just keep downloading these things, and it's all, not like Albertans have forgotten. We haven't forgotten. We have running lists, we remember, we feel the damage that was inflicted, we see the marks that were inflicted, so we know. But would it be really great if the government could tally up for us how much funding was cut or downloaded onto municipalities? I think that would be very telling if we could get a really accurate picture of all of the municipalities, all of the communities right across Alberta, and let's see what this last two years has cost, and let's see what Bill 56 will do. Because Bill 56 has the ability to cause enormous pressure for communities and for individual Albertans. You know, the, the other thing is there, there's this, this, continuation, this continuation of government expecting Albertans and communities to continuously pay more. Yet somehow, I don't get it, they frame themselves as these, you know, we will never raise taxes. We will never, you know, we don't ever want people to pay more. Yet the reality is they're doing it. They're doing it, they're just not being upfront about it and saying they're doing it, whether it's bracket creep for personal income taxes, whether it's removing caps. I mean, it's just happening all over the place. Yet falsely, I believe, Madam Speaker, this government stands up and says they're doing the opposite. So we're making this historic investment in policing. Really, they're charging municipalities. They're taking away revenue streams from municipalities to pay for policing, but they don't tell you that part. You know, another, uh, it's just frustrating, Madam Speaker, it, to consistently stand in this place and try to counter some of the spin and to try to explain uh, to Albertans who don't have a lot of time because they're busy living their lives, busy dealing with a deadly pandemic, busy dealing with their kids in school, then out of school, and pressures, and too many people have lost their jobs. People don't have time to pay attention to what's happening in this place every single day. So it's our job to let them know what is before us, what is the potential good, and what is the potential harm. And I think that uh, I can speak for my, myself, and hopefully my colleagues on this side, is that we take that very seriously, is to let our constituents know what the potential ramifications of peace pieces of legislation like this are. And we will continue to let them know of the harm that is coming. Um, you know, Madam Speaker, before um, I run out of time, I just, I just want to uh, say one thing is, I hope before this debate is over, that other than you know spewing back rhetoric and talking points, I really do hope at some point uh, members of government will stand up and explain explain these decisions and how they expect municipalities to I hesitate to, to interrupt, but the clock strikes 4.30. The House now stands adjourned until next Monday at 1.30 p.m.